Committee on the Judiciary, Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. I welcome everyone to today's meeting uh, on HR 40. Before we begin, I explain to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearings today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to judiciarydocs at mail.house.gov and we will have them distributed to members and staff as quickly as possible. Okay. I'll now recognize myself for an opening statement. The enslavement of people of African American descent in uh, America was started before we were a country in 1619 and has gone on for uh, through through the end of the Civil War. Uh, the uh, effects this has had a, this has been a crime against humanity, and the effects it's had on our society and on African Americans in general continue to uh, cause difficulties for people uh, in America. Uh, and everything from racial inequality, uh, econ economic opportunities, which have been uh, manifest, and disparate health outcomes, which have been uh, so, so sad and sad and come to much light recently, but gone on for centuries, and to the plague of unjustified police violence against Black Americans. Slavery was our nation's original sin. Our Constitution protected it, embodying various compromises that gave disproportionate power to slave states. For example, the three-fifths clause, which we always hear about, counted a slave as three-fifths of a person for population counts, which in turn gave disproportionate representation to slave states in the House of Representatives and accordingly in the Electoral College, which was created uh, as a way to elect a president. Uh, and that gave slave states another avenue to exercise disproportionate influence over national affairs. In essence, slaves counted for three-fifths toward the representation in Congress and the Electoral College, but it gave slaves nothing. It gave their masters something, and it gave them more power. And, and so it was not Congress wasn't made up of representation of people who had rights and who uh, were, were free people. It was representative of, of in the South of people who didn't. And then it was a compromise that uh, uh, stained our Constitution. Uh, it is only fitting then that in the midst of a continuing reckoning over police treatment of um, Black people in a pandemic that has disproportionately impacted Black Americans, that we should hold this hearing today on HR 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals to, for African Americans Act. Uh, our colleague, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, who's a member of the subcommittee, is the current lead sponsor of this legislation. I'm proud to be and have been an original co-sponsor uh, ever since I came to Congress in 2007. Uh, Chairman Nadler's with us, who's also a longtime co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, great, the greatest credit for HR 40 belongs really to two individuals. Uh, first and foremost, our former colleague and the former chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, my friend, my mentor, and, and my political father when I came to Congress, the late John Conyers Jr. He first introduced this legislation over 30 years ago and reintroduced it every Congress thereafter until his retirement. Uh, he, he named it H.R. 40 for the promise that was given slaves after the Civil War for having 40 acres and a mule. And that's where H.R. 40 came from. Uh, John Conyers was a great man and a great leader and should properly re remembered here today. The second individual most responsible for H.R. 40 is unfortunately uh, 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 one of the most despised characters in American history, John Wilkes Booth. You know, why John Wilkes Booth? Because when he assassinated Abraham Lincoln, uh, that led to Andrew Johnson becoming the president of the United States, and President Johnson effectively rescinded the promise made by General William Tecumseh Sherman to former slaves that they would each be guaranteed that 40 acres of land and that mule, that each person uh, would be, they'd become free as free persons, a promise that colloquially referred to as 40 acres and a mule. That ended with the assassination of President Lincoln, and it really started off a, uh, serious problems in our country. And, uh, uh, shortchanged the newly freed Americans. H.R. 40 would create a commission to study the history of slavery in America, the role of the federal and state governments in supporting slavery and racial discrimination, other forms of discrimination against the descendants of slaves, and the lingering effects of slavery on African Americans. The commission would also make recommendations as to appropriate ways to educate the American public about its findings and appropriate remedies in light of those findings. And I want to digress for a minute and 
mention a hearing we had. It might have been the first full hearing we had on HR 40 back in about 2007 or 2008. One of our witnesses was Charles Ogletree, one of the giants uh, in the uh, uh, courtroom and with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He said at that time, HR 40 was a study of reparations. It may not be the 21st century equivalent of a, a, a 40 acres and a mule and the 21st century equivalent, he said, was an SUV and a condo. He said it might be gigantic programs to help people, particularly African Americans, but others who have been disproportionately affected in health care and economic opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, an honest reckoning with the federal government's role in protecting the institution of slavery has been a leading priority of my congressional career. Uh, back in 2007, I introduced HR, HRS 194. That was my first year in Congress. An apology by the House of Representatives for its role in perpetuating both slavery and its noxious offspring, Jim Crow. The House ultimately passed that resolution that year with the help of the chairman, Mr. Conyers, who put it on the suspension calendar, and we passed it in 2008 by a voice vote. As I noted, my resolution is it was not just slavery itself that was wrong, but also the visceral racism against persons of African descent upon which American slavery depended, a racism that wanted to become entrenched in the nation's social fabric and evil that we must continue to confront today. Um, my resolution emphasized the, the white slavery was our nation's original sin, while slavery was our nation's original sin, the underlying sin of anti-black racism did not end with the Civil War and the 13th Amendment, and Congress's inaction and acquiescence in the face of such racism was a, a big reason why. Uh, the Senate passed a resolution similar to ours, but not quite the same uh, the, in the following Congress. We unfortunately didn't pass them at the same time and have a joint resolution, but the Senate passed an apology as well. And uh, uh, that, that was a good act by the Senate. It's unfortunate we weren't able to put them together. Uh, I recently, I watched a couple of movies in the last couple of days. Uh, Chadwick Boseman's movies uh, about uh, uh, Jackie Robinson and one about Thurgood Marshall. And in those movies, I was so affected by what you saw. And I know they're movies, but they reflected life. And the, and the racism that Jackie Robinson faced getting into baseball, that was 1947 when he was with Montreal and then the Dodgers. Racism from the, from the coaches, from the other players, and from the fans. It was just disgusting. Uh, and, and Thurgood Marshall faced the same thing in uh, up in Connecticut when he and Mr. Friedman were representing a criminal defendant. Mr. Friedman faced it too. Uh, some of the, the racists that, that uh, took out actions against African-Americans took it out against the Jewish man too, uh, the attorney calling him a kike and beating him up. So there's been a whole lot of horror in our nation's past and a lot of it's been racism that is still we suffer from. Racism became further entrenched after slavery's end as reflected in the societal attitudes and Jim Crow laws as the system of racial segregation laws intended to separate and, uh, and uh, unequal societies for whites and African-Americans that was enforced through both official means, uh, which I unfortunately saw as a young child, colored water fountains, colored restrooms, colored sections at the football stadium, Mr. Mr. Owens. When I went to the football stadium here in Memphis, the place for African-Americans to sit for the big SEC football games was in the end zone, in the lower corner, in the lower 10 rows, the only thing they could have done to make the seats worse would have put to put a hot dog stand in front of the to, to interfere with the the uh, vision. It was just unbelievable what they did with un unequal uh, opportunities. But there was also lynchings, even worse, and and they were advertised and and, and people came to watch the lynchings and and get body parts and to cheer. It was just disgusting. This was around the turn of the century and through the 1900s. Uh, there was violence, intimidation, and disenfranchisement mostly in the South, but other places as well. It was not until 100 years after the end of slavery that Congress, under pressure from the Civil Rights Movement, uh, Thurgood Marshall's work, Dr. King's work, uh, Baird Rustin and others, finally earned, uh, carried on, out its duty to end Jim Crow by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and other core civil rights statutes better fulfilling the Constitution's guarantee of equal citizenship for all. And while those great civil rights leaders were greatly responsible, for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and certainly our, our late colleague John Lewis was too. Something that sometimes is forgotten in, in those facts is that the assassination of John Kennedy, a second assassination of an American president, uh, although we had others in between uh, President McKinley, uh, but President Kennedy's assassination led to an outpouring 
of, of, of support for these acts that Linda Johnson was able to help um, um, bring into legislation. He nurtured them and brought them forth. But while the, the, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln hurt the effort at having a, a opportunity, the assassination of John Kennedy unfortunately helped it. Today, our nation continues to struggle with the legacy of the anti-Black racism that undergirded slavery and Jim Crow. We see this in statistics that paint a bleak future, a blank, bleak picture. For instance, according to the Census Bureau, 18.8 percent of African Americans lived in poverty in 2019, compared to 7.3 percent of non-Hispanic whites who lived in poverty. The Washington Post reported last year that in 2016, the net worth of African American households was $13,024 which was less than 10%, less than 10% of the $149,000 net worth of non-Hispanic white households. Limited access to wealth building resources and opportunities have led to this stark disparity. For instance, African-Americans continue to face discrimination in the workplace. They also have limited access to educational opportunities according to the National Education Association. The high school graduation rate for African-Americans was 67% compared to the nationwide average of 81%. They also continue to face racial segregation in housing and discrimination in the availability of quality health care services and most other facts of life. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exaggerated the effect of the structural racial disparities. Workers on the front lines at low paying jobs, often um, not covered by unions in the South uh, and collective bargaining and, uh, and, and lower wages and, and, and contact with people on the front lines where COVID-19 is spread. Enacting HR 40 would be an important step in finding effective long-term solutions to these problems, ones that can trace their origins to our nation's shameful history of slavery and anti-Black racism. Professor Ogletree of Harvard noted, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, about the 40 acres and a mule, but he also put a focus on the poorest of the poor, including efforts to address comprehensively the problems of those who have not substantially benefited from integration or affirmative action. I hope our hearing today can lead to a further fruitful conversation with the hope of achieving that goal. I thank our witnesses for being here today and look forward to their testimony. I, uh, at this point in our hearing, we normally recognize the uh, ranking member. Uh, the ranking member is Mr. Johnson, but today Mr. Burgess Owens, a uh, um, new member from the state of Utah, I believe will serve as ranking member. And I will recognize Mr. Owens for his opening statement. Today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on uh, June 19th, uh, 2019, I was honored to testify before this committee as a witness for the hearing on the HR 40 in the path of restoration of justice. Little did I know that a little less than two years later, I would once again participate in this hearing of this subcommittee, this time as a member. I wanna thank the ranking member Johnson for uh, the honor of acting as ranking member for this hearing. And I want to once again thank uh, Chairman Cohen, Cohen uh, my fellow committee members and uh, invited guests for this opportunity to share my story for, with you today. Before I share my story, let me emphasize three points to help guide us through our discussion. First, uh, let me reiterate that slavery was, it was and still is an evil, whether it be the 83 year history of our nation or prior 3000 year history or the presence around the world today. Incompatible with American ideals, we purge the stain from our nation's soul at the cost of 600,000 American lives. I'm a product of that evil practice. My great great grandfather Silas arrived here in the belly of the slave ship, sold to the Burgess Plantation. He escaped through the Underground Railroad and died a successful entrepreneur. Built the first black church, uh, elementary, purchased 102 acres of farmland that he paid off in two years. Second, reparations is not the way to right our country's wrong. What I propose later will be more, more lasting. Third, it is impractical and a non-starter for the US, United States government to pay reparations. It is also unfair and heartless to give black Americans the hope that this is a reality. The reality is that Black American history is not one of a hapless, hopeless race oppressed by a more powerful white race. It is instead a history of millions of middle and, and wealthy class Black Americans throughout the early 20th century achieving their American dream. We're discussing the, the, this morning the theory of reparation. It's nothing new. It's been tried over the last 100 years, resulting in the misery and death of over 100 million men, women, and children. It's called redistribution, redistribution of wealth or socialism. Instead of that theory, I'd like to share the reality of a race whose history of success in America has been stolen uh, and what we can do to repair that damage. I grew up in the deep South, Tallahassee, Florida in the fifties and sixties, the days of KKK, Jim Crow and segregation. It was my community that was our nation's most com competitive community. We believed and taught the love of God, country, family, respect for women, authority. 
We believe in commanding respect through meritocracy, not just in sports and entertainment, but in every discipline, math, science, exploration, innovation, farming, entrepreneurship. We had a reputation as a race for our courage and commitment. We led our country in the growth of the middle class during that period. Men matriculated from college. Men committed to marriage over 70%. And the percentage of entrepreneurs was over 40%. Before we embraced the theory that real success was moving out of our community and integrating into white neighborhoods, businesses, and schools, our community turned within. I remember as a young man, Perkins Service Station, Speed Grocery Store, Breakers Pharmacy, FAMU Hospital with only black doctors and nurses, when 50 to 6% of black Americans in the 60s nationwide lived the middle class lifestyle. We were taught respect for our flag and raised by a generation of men who fought for it. They taught us that you can't demand or beg for respect. You can only command respect through meritocracy. We're taught pride in our history, both American and black history. We're taught about Christus Addis, America's first freedom martyr in, in the Revolutionary War. This is Tuskegee Airmen and over 100,000 black men, including my father, who fought against the godless ideologies of Marxism, socialism, and communism. We were taught to recognize and appreciate progress. I entered the NFL in 1973 at a time, there were no black quarterbacks, black centers, or middle, black middle linebackers. They were white thinking men position. 40 years later, our nation has elected a black American as president and a black female as vice president. It's called progress. Once we lose our history, we lose pride in our past, appreciation for our present, and the vision for our future. If we're sincere about repaying black Americans for our loss, let's give us back, give us back our history. That includes the history of we the people, whose dear Christian values have granted every generation the opportunity to look at each other better from inside out, not outside in. In doing so, you'll ensure pride within our race as we accept our lineage as victors. And the same history will command the respect from our fellow Americans, an example of how to overcome the most overwhelming odds. And the most important thing is that we realize the failure of that's happening today is a failure not of the American system, not a free market, not of the faith and the neighbor and the, and the family system. It's a failure of policies. We have 75% of the black boys in the state of California in 2017. They cannot pass standard reading and writing tests. We have three schools in Baltimore that have zero, black schools in Baltimore have zero proficiency in math. 10 years ago, we had 93% of the black teen males in, in, uh, in, 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 um, in Chicago unemployed. These are policies policies we can change, but we first need to, to recognize and understand the pride of my race, the pride of those who came before us, and that they cannot be forgotten or, or disappear because they work too hard to command respect of our fellow Americans. I feel we do that. We change our policies so the American, the Black American uh, uh, youth and, uh, and, and generation can take advantage of the same things that all, all other Americans can do so, then we will take again our place as being one of the, the, the most, most impressive races in our nation. With that, I yield back. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Owens. Appreciate your opening statement. I hope you see my, my lapel pin here. Recognition for <laughs> Miami chair, chair. There we go. Love of the no case. <laughs> thank you. I now would like to recognize the chairman of our full committee, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing on H.R. 40, Exploring the Path to, to Reparative Justice, gives us the opportunity to reflect on the shameful legacy of slavery and Jim Crow in this country and to examine how we can best move forward as a nation. For nearly three decades, the former chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, John Conyers of Michigan, introduced H.R. 40, which would establish a commission to study proposals for slavery reparations. Our colleague, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, has taken up sponsorship of this legislation, and I am pleased to be an original co-sponsor. H.R. 40 is intended to begin a national conversation about how to confront the brutal mistreatment of African Americans during chattel slavery, Jim Crow segregation, and the enduring structural racism that remains endemic to our society today. Even long after slavery was abolished, the anti-Black racism that undergirded it reflected and defined part of our nation's attitudes, shaping its policies and institutions. Today, we still live with racial disparities in access to education, healthcare, housing, insurance, 
employment, and other social goods that are directly attributable to the damaging legacy of slavery and government-sponsored racial discrimination. These disparities in terms of disproportionate burdens on African Americans have only been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. It is important to recognize that H.R. 40 makes no conclusion about how to properly atone for and make recompense for the legacy of slavery and its lingering consequences. It does not mandate financial payments of any kind, and it, is, it, and it does not prejudge the outcome of the Commission's work. Instead, it sets forth a process by which a diverse group of experts and stakeholders can study the complex issues involved and make recommendations. In fact, most serious reparations models that have been proposed to date have focused on reparative community-based programs of employment, healthcare, housing, and educational initiatives, righting wrongs that cannot be fixed with checks alone. This moment of national reckoning comes at a time when our nation must find constructive ways to confront the rising tide of racial and ethnic division. On January 6th, we saw the ugly confluence of such divisions as white nationalist groups appeared to be among those playing a central role in the violent assault on the United States Capitol. And last summer, we saw an outpouring of protests stemming from the killings of unarmed black people by police. White nationalism and police community conflict are just part of the long legacy of anti-black racism that has shaped our nation's views, institutions, and societal attitudes. That racism and division hold back our country's longstanding efforts to carry out what the preamble to our Constitution says it is designed to do, to form a more perfect union. Reparations in the context of H.R. 40 are ultimately about respect and reconciliation and the hope <coughs> that one day all Americans can walk together toward a, more, toward a more just future. I hope that the commission established by H.R. 40 can help us better comprehend our own history and bring us closer to racial understanding and advancement. Today's hearing gives the subcommittee an important opportunity to hear from witnesses directly involved in shaping the discourse on heal healing our society and creating a path to reparative justice. I am pleased that we have such a distinguished panel of witnesses whose testimony will assist us greatly in understanding the scope of our inquiry. The discussion of reparations is a journey in which the road traveled is almost more important than the exact destination. I am pleased that the subcommittee is beginning this process today, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. Uh, Mr. Owens, is, is, uh, do, you, do you need time for a ranking member statement, uh, or are we going to proceed on to uh, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee? Let's go ahead and proceed we'll, on to Ms. Jackson Lee. We'll proceed, Thank you, yes, sir. sir. Uh, the uh, uh, right, one of the members of our committee and the sponsor of this resolution is Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee from Houston, Texas. She was largely responsible for the formation uh, of the, the panelists on this uh, uh, dais as well as uh, the driving force behind this resolution today, taking the leadership that John Conyers left to be picked up, uh, just as she took the leadership of uh, uh, Barbara Jordan. She's picked up uh, many great uh, ta tasks. Ms. Jordan will be recognized now for an opening statement, and at some point later on, she will take my spot as the chair of this committee for uh, the time that I have to be vacant. Ms. Jackson Lee, you're recognized for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much, and thank you for your great leadership uh, and ongoing support and your history of righting the wrongs of racial injustice in this nation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nadler, for your assistant support of this legislation, uh, beginning with our beloved late colleague, uh, John Conyers, and to my colleagues on the committee, on the Constitution Subcommittee, I am appreciative of your graciousness as well uh, in joining us in this hearing. Uh, thank you very much uh, to our ranking member, both Mr. Johnson uh, and uh, the gentleman uh, from uh, Colorado, I believe. Thank him uh, very much for his statement today. Uh, and this is what uh, this hearing is about, to be able to speak to the nation and for the nation uh, to continue its overwhelming support 
that it is given to HR 40. Uh, and that has been one of the comforting aspects of continuing to carry this legislation out to speak in support of HR 40 uh, and uh, the legislation that I introduced that establishes a commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. It is an active commission. It is to study, but it is also to develop reparation proposals. Now we come from a community, a race of people that have been known as overcomers. We shall overcome and we have overcome. Mr. Owens has eloquently spoken of the overcomers. We're successful. Uh, we believe in determination and we believe in overcoming the many bad balls that we have been thrown. We've caught them and we've kept on going. That is not the point of HR 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. We're hidden in the corners of this nation of those of African American heritage, the descendants of enslaved Africans who have felt uh, the sting of disparities. They continue to feel that sting. Now more than ever, the facts and circumstances facing our nation demonstrate the importance of HR 40 and the necessity of placing our nation on the path to reparative justice. That is what HR 40 is about. This commission will probe into the facts of the longstanding impact of disparities that, that slavery brought about in this country. We still experience them today. When this committee last met to discuss this legislation, we required three overflow rooms to contain the scholarship and the passion displayed in support of this bill. I'm very pleased to say that we've had over 170 co-sponsors close to that now, and those members of Congress, I wanna thank them personally because there are wide perspective and spectrum of political views from progressives to moderates to conservatives coming from all regions of the United States, all racial backgrounds, that is America. That is what repair is all about, reparative justice. Since that time, we have seen a pandemic sweep the country, taking more than 500,000 souls in its wake and devastating the African-American community. According to the latest estimates from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, black people get COVID-19 at a rate nearly one and a half times higher than that of white people. They're hospitalized at a rate nearly four times higher uh, than them and are three times as likely to die from the disease. We've seen it in our cities and our rural communities across America. Interestingly enough, a recent peer-reviewed study from Harvard Medical School suggests that reparations for African Americans could have cut COVID-19 transmission and infection rates both among Blacks and the population at large. Their analysis based on Louisiana data determined that if reparation proposals had been implemented before the COVID-19 pandemic, narrowing the wealth gap, COVID-19 transmission rates in the state's overall population could have been reduced by anywhere from 31 to 68 percent. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit into the record the Harvard article. Without objection, it should be. Since our last hearing, we have also seen hundreds of thousands. Since our last hearing, we have also seen hundreds of thousands peacefully take to the streets in support of black lives and accountability for law enforcement. Many of these protesters carried signs in support of HR 40 and made the important link between policing reform and the movement for reparative justice. Tragically, we have also witnessed insurrectionists attack this institution, brandishing symbols of division and intolerance that echo back to the darkest periods of our nation's history. Clearly, we require reckoning to restore national balance and unity. The government sanctioned slavery, and that is what we need, a reckoning, a healing, reparative justice. We need to bring our nation together. And this commission is really, it is no figment of your imagination. It is a commission that will be appointed by the majority leader of the United States Senate, uh, the Speaker of the House, the President of the United States, a commission that will be funded for fact-based hearings, the opportunity for all people to be heard, and then, yes, a reparative healing of proposals to deal with the questions of the starkness of the life of African Americans in this country. Like our last hearing, the minority has selected two African American witnesses to speak against H.R. 40. Uh, that is their privilege, but we know that justice facts uh, and that life that was led and continues to be led by African-Americans is on our side. Their 
election, however, fails to undermine the overwhelming support for this legislation and merely demonstrates the multiplicity of views within the black community. I'd ask unanimous consent to submit into the record a message from the CARICON Reparations Commission on the occasion of the United States Congressional hearings on H.R. 40, Bill 17, uh, February 17, 2021. Mr. Chairman, I ask uh, for that uh, submission. Without, without the uh, dissent, it's so granted. So entered. Thank you. I also ask Mr. Chairman uh, to thank you. And I also ask Mr. Chairman uh, for, as I conclude, for the submission of the why we can't wait letter, because the question that Dr. King asked is relevant today, why we can't wait. It has been signed, Mr. Chairman, by more than 300 organizations from varying backgrounds, racial backgrounds, including Japanese Americans, rabbinical associations, uh, individuals from the uh, Diocese of the Episcopalians, the NAACP Urban League, and many others. As I conclude, I ask my colleagues to recognize that what we speak of today is a based on the continuing impact of the brutality of slavery. And as I close, I need you to take a look at what I offered to put into the record. This was our life, the back of a beaten slave. This was our life into the 20th century pains of African Americans, men and women. This was our life. This was our life. When we were in public display, brutalized, our life was also the Tulsa riots where 300 African Americans were buried in a unmarked grave. And so, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent for those pictures of lynching that continued into the 20th century and offered, and offered to say, that I conclude my remarks by saying this is a potent and powerful hearing today, and I'm glad that we're responding to the majority of Americans who see the value in HR 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent that the pictures be submitted into the record. Pardon me. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. Those will be entered into the record. That objection. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To to witnesses. Thank you. We will welcome our witnesses and, and thank you all of them for participating. There are eight witnesses, six picked on the Democratic side and two on the Republican side. And uh, while I won't be here for the uh, some of the testimony, uh, Mr. Herschel Walker's in particular, uh, I was a fan of his, except when he played the Memphis Tigers and uh or the memphis i think it was the grizzlies or the, whoever we were in the, in the league when usfl uh, but i'd like to welcome all of our witnesses and and let you know that your testimony is you like to summarize your testimony in five minutes normally we have lights to tell you whether you've got five four minutes or more to go a green light one minute uh yellow and a red light to say your time's up but it, with this system we, we will have we will have uh uh, we will have uh, timing on, on, on your screens to tell you how much time you have left, and please try to keep your statements to simply five minutes. Uh, all of your, our witnesses have a legal obligation to provide truthful testimony and answers to the subcommittee, and any false statements you make today may subject you to prosecution under Section 1001 of Title 18 of the United States Code. Uh, also, I'd like to note that we've been have scheduled testimony we, we had from former Congressman and Cabinet Secretary Norman Mineta. Unfortunately, we were informed yesterday that he is very ill, not able to participate today. Uh, I wish him a full and speedy recovery. Our first witness is Shirley Weber. Uh, she is a California, Sec the California Secretary of State position she has held since December of 2020, a, a, a newbie. She previously served as a member of the California State Assembly, representing the 79th Assembly District, including portions of San Diego, after having been elected in 2012. Before that, she served on the San Diego Board of Education as a professor of African American Studies at San Diego State University. She received her PhD in communications as well as her master's and bachelor's degrees from uh, UCLA. Uh, Secretary Weber, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. And I uh, wanna thank uh, the Chairman Nadler, uh, Chairman Cohen and the ranking member uh, Johnson, as well as thank Congresswoman Jackson Lee for inviting me to be with you this morning. As pointed out, I am currently the Secretary of State for the state of California, the first African-American 
who's ever held that position in 170 year history of the state of California. Uh, and so I come to you today as the author also uh, last year when I was in the assembly of AB 3121, our reparations bill. For us in California, we are very clear that we need not ask whether there or not slavery has had an impact, but instead illuminate the extent to which it has had an impact. Uh, we are at, through AB 3121, which is law in California, uh, have esta are establishing the task force to study and develop a reparations proposals for African Americans. It will consist of experts who study slavery's impact, education, educate Californians, uh, compile a report of their findings, and provide information and recommendations to our legislature as to what we need to do to repair the damage done as a result of slavery. The body that will exist, the task force, it will encompass experts in fields such as history, ethnography, a law, and civil rights. And more importantly, the body will consist of those who understand how we as Californians still reap the consequences of slavery, both nationally and in our own state. California's history with slavery is often not well known, but between the statehood in 1850 and the end of slavery in 1865, California, though named a free state, had many uh, laws and rules and regulations that basically made it a haven for slavery. Uh, California legislature authorized Southern slaveholders to hold persons in bondage so long as they entered the state under an enslaved property state. We did not provide sanctuary to any slave who ran, who was basically seeking freedom. In 1852, we adopted some of the most harsh fugitive slave law in the country, encompassing state and local uh, law enforcement or authorities to enforce self-emancipated persons living within the state back into slavery. The California Supreme Court ordered fugitive slaves, as in, as in the case of Archie Lee, to return to its enslavers in direct violation of California's law. And until the end of the Civil War, California city, count, and, uh, county, and uh, uh, law enforcement authorities enforced the fugitive slave law. They enforced also a contract labor system that was no more than a slaveholder's effort to maintain their slaves in bondage. In other words, California state, county, and city authorities actively supported the institution of black, of black slavery, both within and beyond the, war, the borders of California. Uh, so this history is often not a part of California's lore, that we somehow or another believe that California was this free state and had no discrimination that existed in the state of California. But it should be noted not only it, that every attempt that has been made by African Americans to attain wealth uh, and, and enjoyed that was enjoyed by others has been met with violence in this nation, not only involved the Black Wall Street in Oklahoma, but also the Allensworth story in California. We have not only taken away the good part, we have taken not only taken away the good part that African Americans have started, but the campaign of terror met by African Americans has, has tactics such as fear mongering, lynchings, discriminatory voting laws, uh, lower wages, denied home ownership. And these tactics have led to inequalities and, and the reality in California. According to Governor Newsom in 2020 state of Black, Cal state of Black uh, California, that we make up only 8% of California's population, yet we make up 43% of the homeless population in California. We also uh, make up only 5.6% of the male population of California, yet we make up 28% of those who are incarcerated, Black men who are incarcerated. So the recent population, and, and also shows us by any indication, that African-American children, despite the fact that they have uh, been in California for many years, continue to perform at the lowest level that's possible. And of course, COVID has emphasized to all of us, the COVID-19, just the disparities that exist in California in terms of the deaths and the health system that has failed us all. In sum, the age of an enslavement, both in California and across the nation, birthed a legacy of racial harm and inequality that continues to impact the conditions of black life in California. Uh, people have suffered various injuries and losses through the malicious culpability, negligence, and conduct of others that have the right to, re and we have the right to redress. Interestingly enough, at California has, we have had um, reparations in many areas throughout in California in this nation, and yet none have felt the need to provide it for African Americans. The task force is currently being established. We hope that the recommendations that will come forth will be recommendations that will begin to repair the damage done to us in California. Uh, by no means does this mean that there should not be federal reparations in any sense. The law, the law clearly states that. 
But out of all due respect, Californians can no longer wait for the national government to do its job. We believe that we must do what is necessary for Californians and be an example of what can happen in this nation when there is serious discussions and research done on African Americans and the impact of slavery. We hope that the nation will join California in forming a task force to be able to address the issue of reparations and the damage that has was, been done and continues to be done as a result of the engagement in slavery. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Our, our next witness is, and I'm going to ha have to work with me on the pronunciation, Tendei Akioma. If I'm wrong, I apologize. She is a professor of law at UCLA and the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Her work fo focuses on the global governance of racism and xenophobia and the legal and ethical implications of colonialism for contemporary international migration. More generally, her research and teaching interests lie in international human rights law, international refugee law, international migration, and property. Uh, she earned her JD and her BA from Yale University uh, and then moved on to the sunny Southern California. Professor, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Congresspersons, it's a privilege to address you today. I'm a professor of law at UCLA School of Law, where I'm a core faculty member of the Promise Institute for Human Rights and the Critical Race Studies Program. And my areas of expertise include international human rights law and the global governance of racism. I'm also the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. In this role, I'm an independent expert who's appointed to provide counsel to UN member states regarding, among other things, the meaning of their obligations under international human rights law to combat racism, racial discrimination, and to promote racial equality. My testimony today is drawn to a great extent from a report I presented to the United Nations General Assembly in 2019 on the urgency of reparations for racial discrimination rooted in transatlantic slavery and colonialism. International law recognizes reparations as necessary for rectifying wrongful acts and providing accountability for human rights violations. Within the international legal system, reparations entail a specific framework and responses, which I describe in full in, full in my written testimony. But briefly, within the system, reparations are defined broadly to require restitution, compensation, satisfaction, rehabilitation, and guarantees of non-repetition. Popular conceptions of reparations are often fairly narrow, focusing only on financial compensation. But by contrast, the international system places emphasis on a more comprehensive approach, according to which financial compensation may certainly be necessary, but not sufficient. Other required measures may include transforming the political, economic, and social institutions and mechanisms for disclosing truth and restoring dignity for those subject to racial subordination resulting from legacies of enslavement. Notably, general measures such as social welfare programs that benefit racially subordinated groups, including people of African descent, that are pursued in the ordinary conduct of government are not a substitute for reparations. Fulfillment of state reparative responsibilities requires tailored interventions that are rooted in acknowledgement of the underlying harm of violations these interventions seek to remedy. In the context of racial discrimination rooted in slavery, reparations address two sets of human rights. First, the historic racial injustices of slavery that remain largely unaccounted for today. And second, the contemporary racially discriminatory effects of structures of inequality and subordination that have resulted from failures to redress the racism of slavery and of colonialism. There's broad consensus in the international community that the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery in general did not terminate the racially discriminatory structures built by those practices. And the consensus is that transatlantic slavery and colonialism remain among the root causes of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance against Africans and people of African descent. As a result, in addition to implicating individual wrongful acts in the past, reparations for slavery implicate entire legal, economic, social, and political structures that enabled slavery and which continue to sustain racial um, discrimination and inequality today. 
This means that the urgent project of providing reparations for slavery requires governments not only to fulfill remedial obligations resulting from specific historic wrongful acts, but also to transform contemporary structures of racial injustice and, and of inequality and discrimination that are the product of centuries of slavery. National commissions, such as those proposed by HR 40, are well positioned to tailor recommendations to the specific legal context um, which sustain racial inequality. In the United States, the history of transatlantic slavery has left an indelible mark. The continued presence of racism, racial discrimination, ideologies of racial su superiority in, legal, in US legal, political, social, and economic structures underscores the interconnection between the historical wrongs of slavery and contemporary injustices. I've joined other UN experts in noting that reparations are not just useful mechanisms for fulfilling moral or political obligations. Rather, reparations for slavery are an integral part of fulfilling the international legal mandate to eliminate racial discrimination. The United States is not exempt from these responsibilities, and HR 40 would represent important progress in fulfilling its obligations under international law. Reparations for racial discrimination rooted in the transatlantic slave trade have proven controversial in the countries that bear the greatest responsibility for the associated violation. In cases where states have pursued reparations for slavery and colonialism, they have done so in racially, in racially discriminatory ways. Notable historical examples exist where whites who have profited and benefited for the most from chattel slavery and colonialism received monetary compensation, while non-whites and their nations were partially or wholly left without redress. The Reparations Commission proposed by HR 40 presents an opportunity for the United States to show international leadership on what can be achieved when sufficient political will exists to remedy historic and persisting racial injustice associated with the enslavement of people of African descent. Among the most significant barriers to the pursuit of reparations for people of African descent in, in the United States and elsewhere is the absence of comprehensive accounting of the harms of slavery and the Reparations Commission would provide the foundation for this accounting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. I appreciate your, your lifelong studies and your work and your passion and your participation. Our next witness is Kathy Masoka. Uh, Ms. Masoka is co-chair of NICA for Civil Rights and Redress. Since 1971, she's worked on youth, workers, housing and redress issues in the Little Tokyo section of Los Angeles. She's a graduate of UC University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Ms. So Ms. Has my voice. Good. Sir, you're recognized. Ms. Pasoka? Yes. Thank Good you. Morning. Good morning, Chairperson, Ranking Member of the Committee, and members of the Committee. The Nikkei for Civil Rights and Redress, NCRR, and Nikkei Progressives supports HR 40 and the Black community's demand for reparations because one, it is the right thing to do, two, it is long overdue, and three, because we know it is possible. We won reparations in 1988, but Japanese Americans were not the first to make that demand. The Black community has long demanded reparations. In 1963, Queen Mother Audley Moore, the mother of modern day reparations movement, launched a campaign claiming back pay for descendants of enslaved peoples, as well as job quotas and training. Groups like the Self-Determination Committee formed in 1956, and along with the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America and the National African American Reparations Committee have called for reparations for the institution and legacy of slavery. And HR 40, as you know, has a long history, thanks to the Congressman, late Congressman John Conyers. Even before the Civil War and since emancipation, individual Black Americans fought for and won limited reparations. Our community's demand for reparations did not arise by itself, but was inspired by the Black community's fight for civil and equal rights in housing, education, and more. Their sacrifices and leadership opened the doors for us and gave us the strength to demand redress and reparations from the US government. We have to acknowledge the generous support of many black groups and individuals who supported us in our campaign for redress, like Congressman Mervyn Dimely, who authored a Japanese American redress bill in 1982, Representative Ron Dellums, who spoke in support of the bill, and the Black Congressional Caucus and many others, including then California Assemblywoman, 
Maxine Waters, and the Reverend Jesse Jackson. HR 40 is an important first step towards rep reparations for the Black community. In 1981, when the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, the CWRIC, a commission to study if a wrong had been committed was first proposed, many of us, including me, were against it, angry that the injustice of the concentration camps was even a question. But we soon understood that this was an opportunity for many former incarcerees to speak out about their feelings and experiences they had held inside for 40 years. So the community swung into action to mobilize testifiers for the hearings. NCRR played a key role in organizing grassroots support within the Japanese American community, insisting that former incarcerees speak at the hearings instead of just having experts or academics testify. Many of the Sansei, third generation Japanese Americans like myself and children of the incarcerees organized this effort. We heard anger, sadness, pain, and strength as we listened to stories we had never heard before. None of us could stop listening. It was an opportunity to begin the healing process for our elders, ourselves, and for the entire community. More importantly, it was a chance for those incarcerated to express their own demands for income and freedoms lost, for babies who had died, for dignity taken away, and much more. The hearings brought our Issei, Nisei, and Sansei, first, second, and third generations together to build a grassroots campaign, educate others about the incarceration, and reach out to other communities to win reparations. Moreover, the hearings solidified our determ determination to hold our government accountable and to continue the campaign no, longer, no matter how long it took. We saw individual reparations as a just accounting and not as a handout. Similarly, HR 40 is an opportunity for all of us to learn about the institution and legacy of slavery and its destructive impact that continues today on the Black community. This is a chance for many Black voices to be heard and for the Black community to express what kind of reparations it is owed. What we must do is listen and learn from these stories, from broader historical context to the most personal testimonies of pain, trauma, and generational struggle. It was important for Japanese Americans to determine our own path toward redress and reparations, and we fully stand behind the Black community as they determine their own path forward. There is no dispute that the wealth of this country was built on the stolen lands of the, of the indigenous, peop, indigenous people and on the free slave labor of Black people. In other words, reparations are owed to Black people and to the indigenous people as guided by their communities. The Movement for Black Lives Toolkit talks about reparations being owed in a manner and form to, de to be determined by Black people themselves. It must take as many forms as necessary to equitably address the many forms of injury caused by the institution and legacy of slavery. HR 40 is a necessary first step towards justice, is the first step towards healing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Pasoka. I appreciate your, your testimony and your uh, relating the experiences of Japanese Americans and African Americans. Our next witness is Mr. Herschel Walker. Mr. Walker is a former professional football player, college football player, athlete in general. He played college football at the University of Georgia, and he won the 1982 Heisman Trophy. During his professional football career that began in the United States Football League with the New Jersey Jets, he played for the Dallas Cowboys, the NFL, the Vikings, the New York Giants, football Giants, and the Philadelphia Eagles. He also completed the 19, competed in the 1992 Winter Olympics as a bobsledder and has competed as a mixed martial artist. He was a supporter of President Trump in 2016 and 2020, spoke at the 2020 Republican National Convention. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Criminal Justice Studies from the University of Georgia. Uh, Mr. Walker, you'll be recognized for five minutes. And at this point, I need to, to go to the Natural Resources Committee for our organizational meeting. And Ms. Jackson Lee, if you're there, if you would take the chair uh, for Mr. Walker's testimony and until I can return. Ms. Jackson Lee. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized. Mr. Walker's been recognized, and you are now the uh, acting chair. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I can't thank you enough for your stupendous leadership and friendship. We will do this together. And again, thank you for your, your history on all of this. Glad to work with you and Chairman Nadler. I just wanted to interject that as you move to your other committee. And I'm delighted to listen to Mr. Walker. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr. Walker, you're recognized. Thank you. Chairman and ranking members, I, I thank you for this opportunity to speak on reparation, which has been spoken about many times over my lifetime, but over the past year has become a hot topic. I asked the question why. There's been many surveys show that a large percentage of black and white teens would say racism is better today than yesterday. We, as, we use black power to create white guilt. My approach is biblical. How can I ask my heavenly father to forgive me if I can't forgive my brother? I never want to put anyone religion down, but my religion teach togetherness. Reparation teach separation. Slavery ended over 130 years ago. I'm back. How can a father be asked his son to spend prison time for a crime he committed? In the case we speak of, research, we're researching father back in history, a history of many are not taught or spoken about in school. America is the greatest country in the world to me. A melting pot, a lot of great races, a lot of great minds that have come together with different ideas and make America the greatest country in the earth, on earth. Have, many have died trying to get into America. No one is dying trying to get out. Reparation, where would the money come from? Does it come for all the other races except the black taxpayers? Who is black? What percentage of black must you be to receive reparation? Do you go to 23andMe or a DNA test to determine the percentage of blackness? Some American ancestors just came to this country 80 years ago. Their ancestor wasn't even here during slavery. Some black immigrants weren't here during slavery, nor their ancestors. Some states didn't even have slavery. We as black Americans have always wanted what the Constitution stated, all men, black, white, and today Latino, Asian, Italian, et cetera, should be guaranteed the uh, alienability of rights of life, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. Years later, after slavery ended, Dr. King, I have a dream speech, said, the, sign, the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was a great beacon of light, but hundreds of years later, we're still not free because of segregation and dis discrimination. Today, I call that reparation. I asked my mom, who is in her mid 80s, her thought on reparation. Her words, I do not believe in reparation. Who is the money gonna go to? Has anyone thought about paying the families who lost someone in the Civil War who fought for their freedom? Your dad and I taught you, speaking of me, to pro provide for you and your family through a good education and hard work. If you give a man a fish, you feed him a day. You teach him to fish, you feed him a lifetime. Reparation is only feeding you for a day. It's removing the sign of for whites only, replacing the sign for no education here. Black Americans asking for a hand up, not a hand out. Another big question, who is the guilty party? Should we start at the beginning where African Americans sold your, the African-American ancestors into slavery and to a slave trader who eventually sold the African-American ancestors to slave owners. The slave owners who had no success and no luck trying to make a Native American who land they took become their slave because the Native American ran away. Well, they thought it was fine then to use African-American who didn't know the country, didn't know the language, they know the religion, and they didn't run away. So I asked, why reparation? Well, slavery is because until the year 2021, still talking about reparation, not equal education, not to compare a game to a horrible period in, our, in my life, but as I fought shoulder and shoulder with my fellow football brothers of other races, I saw struggles they were encountering the same as I. And I heard them speak to their parents of problems my family were dealing with as well. If a black player would have been given something different than any other player, it would have created problems within the team, separation and division. Ezekiel 1820, the righteousness of the right shall be upon him. The son shall not suffer for the crime of the father, 
nor the father suffer the crime of the son, unless either father or son know beforehand the father or son was a criminal. To help any race, provide them with a good quality education and help incentivize through opportunities with responsibilities, which helps generations in the future. If reparation is a free is a fee or a correction for a terrible sin of slave owners, government, and others, but we punish the non-guilty party, if it, is, is it not creating division or separation with different races? I feel it continues to let us know we're still African American rather than just American. Reparation or atonement is outside the teaching of Jesus Christ, who you are teaching, who will not be teaching the word of God. So I speak back. Thank you very much, Mr. Walker, for your testimony. I'm delighted to now be able to introduce our next witness is Mr. Cam Howard. Mr. Howard is the male co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America or in COBRA. If I might, uh, in COBRA is a founding father and mother of the effort and the mission of HR 40, working early on with the late Dean of the United States Congress, John Conyers, and continuing to work with over 300 organizations uh, that are now standing uh, very effectively in support of HR 40. And COBRA is a mass-based coalition of organizations and individuals organized for the sole purpose of obtaining reparations for persons of African descent in the United States. He is a Chicago businessman and real estate investor and a longtime activist on the issue of reparations and reparative justice. I think it is important to take note of the fact uh, that Mr. Howard is a businessman, an investor, but he's also someone who understands pulling yourself up by the bootstraps works when you have boots. In 2015, as a member of the National African American Reparations Commission, he led a team to revise HR 40, and in June of 2020, he successfully led the work to pass the City of Chicago Subcommittee on Reparations. He have lived it. Uh, he has been successful, and he understands that the nation now needs uh, HR 40. Mr. Howard, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Mr. Howard. I'll give Mr. Howard one more minute, uh, one more moment, and then we'll um, go with our next witness and we'll bring Mr. Howard back in in a moment. Let me now move to our next witness is Mr. Elder. Mr. Elder is a conservative attorney, author, and host of the nationally syndicated radio program, The Larry Elder Show. He also writes a nationally syndicated column and produces videos for his YouTube channel in association with the Epic Times. Mr. Elder received a JD from the University of Michigan and his BA from Brown University. Mr. Elder, you're recognized for five minutes. Congresswoman Lee, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I am the executive producer of a documentary that came out June 19 last year called Uncle Tom, an oral history of the black conservative. And as Congresswoman Lee pointed out, uh, black people are a race of overcomers. And it talks about the fact that despite all the problems that have been brought up in this committee about racism, about slavery, about Jim Crow, uh, black people have overcome to the point now where only 20% of black people are below the federally defined level of poverty. Still too high, but in 1940, that number was 87%. And 20 years later, that number had been reduced to 47%, a 40 point drop in 20 years. That is the greatest 20-year period of economic expansion for the history of Black Americans. And notably, they came before uh, the Brown versus Board of Education decision. They came before uh, the civil rights uh, bills of 1964, 1965. Despite all of this racism, all of this prejudice, Black people still overcame. I also find it ironic we're having this hearing 13 years 
after we elected and then reelected the first black president of the United States. I'm old school. I still get the newspapers thrown to my house. And the day that Obama got elected, I got the New York Times and the LA Times thrown to my home. And on the front pages of both those newspapers, there were colored pictures of black parents hugging their kids, crying, saying things like, now I can say for the first time truly that if you work hard, you can be anything you want to be. In 1997, Time Magazine and CNN did a broad survey of black teens and white teens and asked both of them whether or not racism was a major problem uh, in America. And both of them said yes, not too surprisingly. But then black teens were asked the following question. Is racism a big problem, a small problem, or no problem in your own daily life? 89% of black teens in 1997 said racism was a small problem or no problem in my own daily life. In fact, twice as many black teens as white teens said failure to take advantage of available opportunities is a bigger problem than racism, end of quote. And that, again, was 23 years ago before Obama got elected, let alone reelected. Speaking of Obama, 2007, he ran for presidency. His rival for the Democratic side was Hillary Clinton. And on the Republican side, the two rivals, primary rivals were John McCain and Mitt Romney. Gallup asked whether or not Americans would not vote for a black person referring to Obama, would not vote for a woman referring to Hillary Clinton, would not vote for a Mormon referring to Mitt Romney, would not vote for uh, a person as old as uh, John McCain would be, 72 years old. And what Gallup found is 5% of Americans said they would not under any circumstances vote for a black person. 11% said they would not under any circumstances vote for a female. 24% said they would not vote for a Mormon. 42% said they would not vote for a person who would be 72 years old when he became president, which would have been the case had John McCain been elected. In other words, Obama as a black person had a smaller barrier than these three white politicians. So having this conversation right now when racism has never been a less significant problem in America, to me, is mind boggling. Right now, Congress is 12% Black, which is roughly the percentage of blacks in America. In 1964, Martin Luther King gave an interview to the BBC. And he said he was surprised at the changes that have taken place in America in recent years. And he believed that a black person could become president in 40 years time, or maybe even less. That's roughly around the time when Obama became president. And Martin Luther King did not say, we will know when we've arrived at the promised land when there's a black coach of Notre Dame, which has happened when there is a black female who's the president of an Ivy League university, which has happened, when blacks are mayors of all the major cities in America, which has happened, when blacks are police chiefs of the major cities in America, when there are superintendents of schools of America or mayors of America, sometimes all three at the same time, he did not say that. He did not say when black people become millionaires and billionaires, which has happened. He did not say when black people become CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. He said when a black person becomes president, that's when we'll know we've reached a point where people are being evaluated based on the content of their character to the extent that it is reasonable to expect. And the idea that slavery built America is belied by the fact that at one time, Virginia was the most populous and wealthiest state in the union, uh, but within a couple of generations, it had fallen behind states in the North because the South depended upon slavery, which impoverished the South relative to the North, which is primarily why the North won the election. No one could have had, or very few people could have had a life harder than my father. My father was 13 years old, born in 1915. He was kicked out of his house by his mother. Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow, at the beginning of the Great Depression. The man walked down the street, did whatever he could. Ultimately, he became a Pullman porter on the trains, which was the largest private employer of blacks in those days. Traveled all the world, became a Marine, was the, one of the first black Marines, a, Pullman, a uh, Montfort Port Marine. And my dad always told my brothers and me the following, hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. You cannot control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you complain about what other people did to you, go to the nearest mirror and say to yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? And my dad always told us this, no matter how hard you work, no matter how good you are, sooner or later, bad things will happen to you. How you respond to those bad things will tell your mother and me if we raised a man. And my father always said this about the Democrat Party. They want to give you something for nothing. And when you try and get something for nothing, you almost always end up getting nothing for something. Thank you very much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Attorney Elder, thank you so very much uh, for 
uh, your presentation today. Mr. Howard, are you present? I am, Congresswoman. Uh, did you hear my introduction? I did, Congresswoman. All right. Um, I think I will then just ditto my introduction to you. Uh, thank you so very much for this longstanding commitment. And I will yield now to you. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, for your strong leadership on this legislation. And Cobra would also like to thank the many congressional co sponsors of the Black Caucus, the Asian Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, and the Progressive Caucus. I am honored for this opportunity to testify before the members of the House Judiciary Committee on the subject of H.R. 40, exploring the path to reparative justice in America. The National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, and COBRA, is in our 34th year fighting for reparations for crimes committed against humanity committed against Africans and their descendants in the United States. And COBRA wants this committee to know that the H.R. 40 Commission is long overdue. During the 32 years in which this bill has languished in Congress, many years have been wasted, many lives lost, and untold sorrows of African descendants have continued and abounded. Even the financial loss to this nation in delaying redress since H.R. 40's first introduction is calculated to be near $25 trillion, about two or three times the cost of any minimally viable reparations plan. This means America would have gotten a 100 to 200% return on a reparations program if it had taken steps to do so. America would in fact be graded today if it had acted correctly at any time in its past. Even still, the opportunity for true greatness can begin with the rightful action of this 117th Congress. H.R. 40 purports to establish a commission to do a comprehensive investigation into the wide scope of harms committed and the range of injuries still being suffered by 48 million Black people in America. The highest standard of reparations is needed to adequately address over 400 years of atrocities and compounded and concretized injuries that this community endures. No quick fix, no singular action, or tweak here or there in existing policy would do. America must engage in full reparations. Full reparations is the international standard for reparations. And in COBRA declares there's no rational reason why the highest standard of redress should not be applied to a people harmed by its own government in so many ways and for so many years. Full reparations has five encompassing areas of repair. One, cessation assurances and guarantees of non-repetition. America must cease all continuing wrongful and injurious acts and put in place structures to ensure that, that they do not resurface in another name as slavery did during the Jim Crow apartheid period. The second area of repair is restitution. The goal here is restoration. Where will we be as a people if not for 246 years of stolen labor and accompanying horrors? If not for the multiple periods of multi-billion dollar plunder post-enslavement, we must be made whole. Three, compensation. Compensation is obligatory if the damage is not made good by restitution, and it must be, quote, appropriate and proportional, unquote, to the gravity of the violations. Four, satisfaction. Here, proposals must be offered that focus, focus on the return of our dignity. In addition, full admission of fault, full acceptance of responsibility, and the willingness to do whatever it takes to repair the wrongs is a foundation of which satisfaction rests. Five, the final component of full reparations is rehabilitation. Initiatives must be developed that address the negative, transgenerational, spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical effects of the historical traumas of enslavement, Jim Crow apartheid, and the ongoing racial violence and police terror. I will conclude with a brief comparison. During the Civil War, 200,000 men, 40,000 women, and 20,000 children of African descent aided the Union Army in saving this country from white nationalist hatred and destruction. Afterwards, a very grateful president and Congress quickly acted to reward their service with previously denied acts of justice, issuing special field order number 15, granting 40 acres and a mule, and passing strong civil rights legislation and three constitutional amendments. Fast forward to November of last year, as the acts of January 6th proved, 
Blacks with our overwhelming vote for the Democratic Party, again, help save America from white nationalist hatred and destruction. It is now time for this 117th Congress to be as justice rendering as the Reconstruction Congresses. Passing H.R. 40 on the way to full reparations is how. A. Luda Continuo, Pomoja, and Billy Shaka, aside to sign of the struggle to continues, together we will be victorious. Many thanks to this committee. Mr. Howard, thank you for that very powerful testimony. I'm delighted now to yield to our next witness, uh, Liz Dreisen Heath. Ms. Heath is Assistant Research and Advocate with the U.S. Program of Human Rights Watch, a leading domestic research and advocacy on reparations and reparative justice, as well as human rights around the world. Her most recent research endeavor, the conditions of pervasive inequality and structural violence stemming from the 1921 Tulsa race massacre of which uh, we commemorate 100 years this year. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, she worked as a special assistant to the director and counsel of the Brennan Center, Washington, D.C. office, and was a researcher at the Center for Research in Education and Social Policy at the University of Delaware. Ms. Heath holds a bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University. Ms. Heath, welcome, and you're recognized for five minutes. On behalf of Human Rights Watch, it is an honor to be here today. Thank you to the committee for this opportunity to testify about this important piece of legislation. I am Dreesen Heath, a researcher and advocate on racial justice issues within the U.S. program at Human Rights Watch, an international organization that investigates human rights violations in over 90 countries around the world, including in the United States. The concept of reparations is well established in international human rights law. At its core is the idea that economic and social conditions cannot improve without addressing and repairing harm. The U.S. has never fully or properly reckoned with the gross human rights violation of chattel slavery and the post-emancipation racist policies that continue to impact Black people in the U.S. today. If racial justice is ever to be achieved, repair needs to be a part of the equation. Chattel slavery was national policy, reducing humans to the status of property, subjecting them to horrific violence and unspeakable cruelty, while simultaneously exploiting them through forced labor that laid the foundation for the U.S. global economy as we know it today. The harms of enslavement range from mass death to routine torture and sexual violence to deprivation of education, food, medical care, and sanitation. The trauma of such harms have been passed down generationally. Post-emancipation promises of restitution in the form of 40 acres and a mule were broken. Coercive discriminatory federal policies created by the New Deal and run through the Department of Agriculture helped to transfer much of the land Black farmers were still somehow able to obtain after slavery to white people, leading to Black farmers being dispossessed from roughly 90% of their land. In the 19th and 20th centuries, Black codes and Jim Crow laws denied Black people the right to vote, serve on juries, allowed them to be exploited for cheap labor, and excluded them from nearly every aspect of daily life reinforcing white cultural, political, and economic power, and perpetuating and deepening in racial inequalities. The KKK, white paramilitary groups, and other white people, some deputized by law enforcement, terrorized Black people. In 1921, for example, a white mob burned down the prosperous Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma, then known as Black Wall Street, killing hundreds of people. The government didn't provide reparations or help rebuild. They placed obstacles in the way of their rebuilding, setting generations of Black Tulsans back, into count back in countless ways, including economically and socially today. And the Tulsa Race Massacre was just one of the many incidents of racial violence carried out by similar white mobs throughout the country between 1877 and 1950. The Equal Justice Initiative documented 4,300 terror lynchings during this period. In the 21st century alone, the federal government redlined many Black neighborhoods as high risk for lenders, 
making it virtually impossible for Black people to get home loans. Urban renewal programs tore down blighted areas, primarily low income and communities of color, displacing hundreds of thousands of families in the process. And federally financed highway systems destroyed Black neighborhoods. All of these policies contributed to institutional racism and the cre creation of present day economic, education, employment, housing, food, sanitation, and health inequities. We've seen firsthand the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, leading to more suffering and death. Black people continue to be police arrested and jailed at rates vastly disproportionate to their numbers. For example, making up 40% of those incarcerated, but only 13% of the overall population. In this way, our policing and criminal legal systems maintain unequal power structures created and dominated by white people, preserving white supremacy. The failure to provide full acknowledgement and repair has clearly worsened injuries in the Black community. How can a nation truly heal if it takes no action towards acknowledging the full scope of pain and dressing the punctured wounds of racism? The U.S. government has created commissions in the past, like the one proposed by H.R. 40, to document and remedy violations. Rather than asking why at this stage, Congress should be asking how. How can we provide comprehensive repair for our grave and systemic failures connected to slavery, and what steps must we take to get there? I urge Congress to account for and repair systemic racism rather than to ignore it and embody it. We are at a defining moment in U.S. history, and reparative justice for the legacy of slavery demands facing the fierce urgency of now. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your testimony uh, that um, is so provocative and well detailed. Thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm delighted now to introduce our last witness, and that is Mr. Hillary O. Shelton. Mr. Shelton is director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau and its senior vice president for advocacy and policy. The question would be, who does not know Mr. Hillary O. Shelton as relates to the fight for civil rights for decades? His calming voice, uh, his beliefs and values have been of great value to those of us in the United States Congress, to the NAACP and the nation. Mr. Shelton is responsible for advocating the federal public policy issue agenda of the oldest, largest, and most widely recognized civil rights organization in the United States. Mr. Shelton's government affairs portfolio includes crucial issues such as affirmative action, equal employment protection, access to quality education, stopping gun violence, ending racial profiling, abolition of the death penalty, access to comprehensive uh, health care, voting rights protection, federal sentencing reform, and a host of civil rights enforcement. He has been a major force uh, and support of information as we went through the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, and as well, his knowledge of H.R. 40 uh, has been uh, both assisting uh, and informative in the work and research of this committee. And so we look forward to hearing from you, Mr. Shelton, as a person that believes in expansion and protection of those who cannot speak for themselves. Mr. Shelton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. I also want to thank my other friends on the committee, including the chairman that had to leave, uh, Congressman Collins, our ranking members, Johnson, vice chair ranking, and of course, the other distinguished members of this subcommittee and the Constitution of the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, as well as the Judiciary Committee for all of his help and all of his work in moving us to this point. We are excited about how things are moving on H.R. 40. This is a bill that we worked very closely with the late great Congressman John Conyers of Detroit, Michigan, to look at the issues that tie together many of the challenges that African Americans and other people of color have this day. Uh, and, of course, the experience of the transatlantic slave trade in the United States of America. 
The NAACP was founded in 1909, about 112 years ago, and has over 2,200 chartered membership units located in every state across the country. We're also on military installations throughout the world as well, places like Italy, Germany, Korea, and Japan, as we participated and joined in the very integration of these armed services as well. Uh, we are a membership-based association that continues to advocate for justice and equality for all American citizens and residents. Throughout the turbulent racial history of our country, the NAACP has steadfastly opposed institutions and persons who blocked our nation's collective ability to reach our goals. 112 years ago, over 60 uh, persons of variety of uh, races, uh, faith and political affiliations resolved to end lynching and race-based discrimination in the United States and just formed the NAACP. Just 20 years before the founding of the NAACP, black men began voting and holding elected offices on the state and national level, including several who were served in our United States, in the United uh, States House of Representatives and the United States Senate uh, were from Southern states. The 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and other laws forged the way for the amazing feat just a few years after the end of legal slavery in this country. At the turn of the 20th century, the first Reconstruction era had all too quickly concluded, and many of the hard-fought gains of elected officials and civil rights advocates of that time were beginning to erode due to the rise of terror groups like the Ku Klux Klan and so-called black codes and uh, placed stumbling blocks in the way of African Americans trying to simply reach the ballot box. I'm here today to let you know of our strong support for H.R. 40, originally authored by the great John Connors, as we mentioned, and presently shepherded by you, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, your great leadership and your stalwart support in addressing the issues of justice in our country are clear in your support for H.R. 40. This legislation is long overdue and should be put into place this year. My hope is that as the 117th Congress gets underway, that you will sign on to this bill as co-sponsors, everyone who hasn't joined so far, and do all that you can to ensure its enactment. This legislation is an important step in acknowledging the inherent cruelty, brutality, and humanity of slavery as practiced in the United States, and would help millions of Americans begin to heal the subsequent emotional wounds that have been festering for centuries. In confronting the ugly legacy of slavery, the commission created by H.R. 40 would examine the impact slavery has had on the racial and economic inequalities still suffered today. The commission would also be charged with renewing reparations proposals to help African Americans regain some of the stature stripped away by our forefathers lost through no fault of our own. Research and academic reports demonstrates that the enslavement of Africans and the transatlantic slave trade were appalling tragedies in the history of our country, not only because of their abhorrent barbarism, but also in terms of their magnitude, organized nature, and the complete negation of the humanity of the enslaved person. The enslavement of Africans constituted an immoral and inhumane deprivation of a person's life, liberty, and cultural heritage. The enslavement of Africans uh, resulted in the extinguishment of millions of Americans inviscerating whole cultures, languages, religions, morals, and customs psychologically as such. The NAACP reaffirms our previous position in support of reparations and very grateful that we're raising this today and hopefully we can move to a point of full passage. The United States, a nation's forged with a revolutionary struggle for inalienable human rights. Natives of Africa were torn by force until the year in 1808 from their homeland and subjected to the barbarities of institutionalized slavery. In this post-revolutionary United States, slavery was maintained by government fiat with violence depriving African Americans of freedom of association, privacy, life, liberty, property, and due process of law in complete abdication of the spirit and spirit of the Bill of Rights from its inception and ratification of its enactment and ratifications of the anti-slavery amendment of 1865. Let me just say, Congresswoman and those who are joining us, 
the issue of slavery is one that did not end with the stroke of uh, Abraham Lincoln's pen and the Emancipation Proclamation. It did not end in a stripping away of the uh, of, of actually adding to the Constitution by passing the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. As a matter of fact, many of the residuals of the transatlantic slave trade, sadly, as we look at the disparities in data, are still very much with us. We believe that this is a problem that must be solved, but like other important problems, in order to solve that problem, we must first measure it. As we're looking at those life conditions that affect African Americans and others in our country, we would look at issues of home ownership. And we would see that in wealth development that African Americans are less likely to own homes than white Americans, one of the key bridges to our wealth in the United States, that is investments to be able to continue to educate and train our children and to prepare for retirement as we become older and older. We know that very well, so thinking about the challenges of the transatlantic slave trade, we know that issues of health care are still very much at a disparity. As we've gone through this pandemic, we recognize disproportionately the African Americans, the descendants of the slave trade, in many cases have no health insurance and in many other cases are underinsured along those lines as well. And that's why as we look at whether it's issues of education and an opportunity for a high quality education and support for our HBCUs, whether we look for small business development, whether we look at other health concerns and other life concerns, such as our criminal justice system, we see that the long legacy of slavery has been something that has actually had a very damaging temperature on African Americans, the African American communities and our families, and we believe that the best way to solve that problem is to take it on head first. And it's like everything else, we want to do the research, we want to hold the hearings. We want to formalize a process in which we can make sure we have the accurate information and we can move forward to making our nation greater still. So Congressman Jackson, I want to thank you for the opportunity for the NAACP to testify today. I want to thank you for your leadership and your continued stalwart support for the importance of all Americans. And certainly as we look at the issues that impact the African-American community, you've been front and center. So we thank you very much for that. And I look forward to any questions we may have in this process. Mr. Shelton, thank you so very much uh, for again, your testimony. Uh, it is now time to begin the questioning. Uh, I will start by yielding myself uh, five minutes. Uh, and um, indicate that uh, each of our members will have the opportunity to question uh, these very stellar and outstanding witnesses. Uh, I will start my questioning uh, with Professor Atahumi, and I hope I've also uh, pronounced your name, but I'm going to again put up in the screen as close as I can um, this picture. Professor, I wanted you to see it. I'm not sure if you saw it before. Uh, it is lynching with an audience of white persons some smiling men and women. Um, and of course, this is the picture of the back of a slave that has been brutalized by a whip. It seems that as the testimony has proceeded, some of our friends uh, who have been represented by very stellar uh, members uh, presented by the minority seem to confuse uh, the overcomers and the uh, ability to cite uh, musicians and athletes and uh, academicians and others from the reparative uh, and the justice element of H.R. 40. If I might cite to you uh, that black people in America are three times the rate of white people uh, with disparities across all age groups. For example, a uh, black infants are more than twice as likely to die as white infants, making the disparity worse than 1850. In addition, when heads of white households who only have a high school diploma are sitting um, are in a class are almost 10 times uh, more wealth uh, with a high school diploma as a white high school graduate than black high, uh, households with the same level of education. This is in the current 21st century. In addition, the gap between black and white wealth is as large today as it was in 1968. Can you comment, uh, Professor, on uh, this question as I present to you? How do you feel the international decade can be utilized 
to advance the cause of reparatory justice for the people of African descent in the United States, but I would appreciate it if you would incorporate uh, this glaring disparity today um, that continued from slavery of disparities in uh, the life expectancy of an infant compared to a white infant, uh, and of course, the gaps of wealth that continue today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Congresswoman, for this invitation to weigh in further. So you're, you're absolutely right to point out that within the United Nations system, which the US is a part, we are in the international decade for people of African descent. And the purpose of this decade is in part to recognize persisting human rights violations against people of African descent, including in the United States that have not been um, addressed. And many of these human rights violations are rooted in racial discrimination, racial discrimination that is a legacy of um, colonialism and enslavement. And so we are in a very important time or almost halfway through the decade. And measures like HR 40, I think, are an essential way of um, fulfilling some of the, the, the goals of the decade, of the international decade of people of African descent. The images that you shared are truly terrifying. And, and the statistics that you also shared, I think, are also um, terrifying and heartbreaking. And I think they speak to two things. One is that reparations is about addressing um, injustices against individuals. So when you show me the image of the, the people who were lynched under the International Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, victims of racial injustices such as those are, are entitled to reparations for the harms that those individuals um, uh, experienced. But even beyond that, reparations is about undoing structures, structures of racial injustice that are a result of legacy and colonial uh, legacies of um, enslavement, such that pointing to individuals who are black, who have succeeded, who are people of African descent and who, who are descendants even of slaves and pointing to their successors can't negate the fact that we have persisting structures of injustice that have to be addressed, including through a reparations frame. And so I think it's important to keep sight both of um, remedying individual harms, undoing structures of injustice that are connected to legacies of um, slavery, and taking the opportunity of taking this action within the international decade um, for people of African descent. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Howard, uh, we've heard that our minority witnesses agree that African Americans, other indigenous people have built this country. In light of all the various entities that unjustly profited from the unpaid labor of African descendants, how might the HR Commission address this issue? And how would you respond to those who say reparations are simply about money? Mr. Howard? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Yes, we in Congress historically stated that there are five basic injury areas that reparations must deal with. Uh, the first is the injury area of the criminal injustice system. As we know that what happened uh, with George Floyd exposed it and the police chair around this country exposed what is going on on a daily basis with black people in this country. And so that must be addressed. Uh, the second uh, injury area is that of education. Uh, the congressman, uh, the chair, Congressman Cohen, talked about uh, the disparity in education. I think that one of the uh, witnesses uh, for the Republicans also talked about uh, the disparities in education. Uh, those type of things have to be addressed under under uh, reparations. Uh, we have to be restored. Uh, the third area is, is the wealth gap and the poverty gap. Uh, th those can be, uh, there was a study by the uh, uh, Citibank that stated that uh, $16 trillion could have been in, infused into the economy if reparations would have been uh, initiated 20 years ago, $16 trillion. Most of that from business revenue of the black community if there was access to capital as other businesses are given access to capital. And so that is uh, uh, reparations that doesn't actually affect the check. Also, we look at the health disparities, health injury area. Uh, we know that um, not only is our physical health, uh, not only is our mental, mental health and emotional health, but also our physical health has been challenged as a result of the historical traumas that we've experienced. Historical traumas can affect um, the ongoing and compounded trauma that our children are facing. It could also affect the reason why many of us are have these uh, pre-existing illnesses that COVID attack. And then finally, our peoplehood. 
uh, we have to uh, address the foundational root cause of the atrocities that have been committed in our in this country against black people and that is that there's some notion built into the minds of whites that they are superior and conversely into the minds of blacks that they are inferior or in the minds of whites that blacks are inferior and so this speaks to the root of the cultural challenges the cultural harms that would have been committed against our people so all of these things have to be addressed under an hr 40 uh commission not just uh the aspect of giving cash to an individual thank you thank you very much uh, mr howard uh our ranking member mr johnson has yielded uh he was present at the beginning of the hearing and so we're delighted now uh to yield five minutes to mr owens mr owens thank you're you. recognized for five minutes thank you so much uh, i think as, as i i'm going to start asking my questions in a second but i'd like just to to bring back a little bit of history because i think history is really important as we talk about our past and where uh, the, uh, a lot of our evils have happened. Uh, and it's not been an American problem. It's been pretty specific. When you think about uh, where slavery began, where segregation, where Jim Crow, there's always always the Democratic Party. Earlier, we mentioned the 40 acres of the mule. That was ended by a Democratic president, Andrew Johnson. We talked about the KKK. That was a Democratic uh, uh, terrorist organization that actually was ended uh, at the end of the uh, 1880s but brought back again by Woodrow Wilson in uh, 1915. Uh, and by the way, the lynching that we're talking about, is horrendous, 4,700 people died by the, the hands of mobs. 1,300 of those uh, were whites, uh, uh, Italians and Catholics, because we're looking at a, a, a people that were just angry, evil people that hated anything that was different from them. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And if we want to talk about reparations, let's look more specifically in terms of the people that actually did it. It was not Americans. Americans fought against that. That's why we end up winning uh, and, 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 and defeating slavery, because so many Americans have decided it was an evil thing to, uh, to finish up. So I wanted to make that make that point. Uh, uh, Mr. Elder, I have a question. Last year, prior to the pandemic, the strength of the U.S. economy helped all Americans, most notably minority Americans. In fact, uh, in uh, CNBC uh, in, in 2019 said American uh, uh, African-American unemployment hit the lowest ever in the history of our country from a peak in, uh, in 20, 2010 of 16.6%. .6%. First of all, uh, how, how did that happen? And uh, is, that, is that in your, in your uh, understanding correct, those, those particular numbers? Well, that's right. It, it happened because uh, taxes got lowered, regulations uh, got eased, and the economy took off. And when the economy takes off, uh, those who are uh, unskilled disproportionately uh, improved, just as happened during the Reagan administration. During the Reagan administration, black adult unemployment fell faster than did white un adult un un unemployment. Hispanic adult unemployment fell faster than white unemployment fell. Uh, teen, uh, black teen unemployment fell faster than white teen unemployment. Uh, good economic policies work. Equal rights and equal results are two very different things, and that's what I think uh, we're getting confused about here. Everybody's entitled to equal rights, but nobody's entitled uh, to equal results. Uh, one of the witnesses, I believe it was Mr. Shelton, referred to Africans as being torn out of their country. Well, according to Harvard's Henry Louis Gates, that's not how it happened at all. 90% of Africans were sold by African chieftains who conquered them uh, in tribes, sold to European slavers and to Arab slavers. And speaking of Arab slavers, the Arab slave trade uh, took place centuries before the European slave trade did and lasted longer, and the death rate was much, much higher. So as we talk about who pays who, uh, this is going to be one of the greatest generational transfers of wealth back and forth because virtually every people on the face of the earth was involved in slavery. Europeans enslaved uh, uh, Europeans, Africans enslaved Africans, as mentioned. Uh, Native Americans even enslaved, uh, enslaved Native Americans. Asians enslaved Asians. In fact, uh, white uh, Muslim slavers took more whites out of the Mediterranean than European slavers took uh, blacks out of Africa to North America. So figuring out who owes what is going to be a hell of an achievement. Now, uh, I've been in radio and TV for some 35 years. And during that time, I have been unsuccessful in getting some of these black leaders on my program. Al Sharpton won't come on. Uh, Jesse Jackson won't come on. Farrakhan won't come on. I will give uh, Congressman uh, Jackson Lee credit because she did come on my show several years ago. You may not remember it, Congresswoman, but she did come on several years ago. And one of the leaders I was able to get on was Kawese Nfume, who's now back in Congress. He was then the president of the NAACP, having left Congress. And I said, Mr. Nfume, as between the presence of white racism or the absence of black fathers, 
which poses the bigger threat to the black community. Without missing a beat, he said the absence of black fathers. In 1918, excuse me, 1915, 18 percent of black fathers, of blacks were born outside of wedlock. That number now is almost 70 percent. I think most of us would agree that there was greater racism in 1950 and then right now. We're not having a discussion about whether or not the welfare state has incentivized women to marry the government uh, and incentivized men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. And it was Barack Obama who said, a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in jail. Why are we having a discussion about the absence of black fathers and all of the unintended consequences that flow through that? Congressman Owens mentioned the high schools in Baltimore where 0% can do math at grade level. Actually, it's 13 public high schools in Baltimore where 0% of kids can do math at grade level, and another half a dozen where only 1% can. Now, Baltimore is a city where, in 2015, uh, Freddie Gray died in police custody, as you know. The mayor was black. Number one and number two running the police department, black. City council, all Democrat, majority black. Three of the six cops who were charged, black. The the gentleman has expired. I'll allow the witness to complete his answer. Okay. Elder, complete Thank, you. Answer. Thank you. The judge before whom two of the of the officers tried the case was black. The state attorney who blocked the charges against the officers was black. The U.S. attorney was black. And the president of the United States is black. And we're talking about systemic institutional racism. To me, it's crazy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Elder. And um, we are certainly appreciative of uh, your words. And we well know that all of those uh, suggestions that you've made is exactly what a commission does. It is fact-finding it repairs and it develops proposals. I'm delighted now to yield to a longstanding supporter of HR 40 and the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Nadler of New York. Mr. Nadler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary Weber, through your efforts, the uh, state of California passed legislation to establish a task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African-Americans. How do you envision the structure and operation of a reparations commission or task force? And can you highlight the key differences between the California approach and that of HR 40? Well, you know, the California approach is kind of modeled after HR 40 and it was passed last year and we're currently in the process of selecting the members of the uh, task force. Uh, it is a task force that is the governor's task force that will um, have the governor select individuals from uh, that he thinks should be a member of it's a nine person task force. We have two members. We'll have the governor will have five. We have two from the uh, House of, uh, for the Assembly and two from the Senate. So the task force will, will basically be a nine person task force. Our goal is to try to use not only the experts that are in the field to inform the task force, but also to utilize the universities of California. I, I am in charge of the California archives as a secretary of state to use our archives. Also, research members have already begun to submit information. The goal is to collect the information about what role um, California played in the whole issue of enslavement and then to begin to talk about its impact with regards to the disparity of resources that exist in California. California is the fifth largest economy in the world, yet it has the greatest wealth gap of any state. Uh, the wealth of African American is one dollar in comparison to a hundred dollars of a person who's white with similar education and background. And so, when we look at that, this group will begin to form a rep, um, discussions concerning it. This is not the first effort at reparations in the past. There have been a couple of bills that have passed with reparations, looking at California's insurance policies, also how, uh, how the insurance industry benefited financially from uh, reparations. Uh, it's also had, so we have our insurance commissioner who's compiling data and information with regards to that. This group will then begin to, for, after, the, after they have had a number of hearings, we plan to also have hearings that will educate California so the people in California understand what has happened with reparations. Too often we think that the only thing we need to do is give somebody some money and everybody's okay. Uh, that is not going to be the issue with the system as deep and pervasive as slavery has been in California and across the nation. Uh, those re those then rep those recommendations will then be taken by the commission uh, and by the legislature, hopefully led by the California Legislative Black Caucus that I that I chaired at one point, uh, and then put into law, put into programs of budget, 
those kinds of things that are essential so that we can measure the impact that's there and begin to repair the damage that's been done. Uh, the task force will then uh, obviously not only have staff and the persons who are working on the budget that will come out of it. So beginning in June, this task force will have been formed and will begin to hold hearings and recommendations that will come forward. Hopefully we can share those with you with the experts that are there. Uh, we hope to be able to use the resources of our institutions uh, to basically uh, set the stage for what really happened in California that will also be probably a mirror for what is happening across the nation. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, now, Mr. Howard, uh, governments, corporations, industries, religious institutions, educational institutions, private estates, and other entities have all played significant roles in supporting the institution of slavery and its vestiges. In light of all the various entities that unjustly profited from the unpaid labor of African descendants, how might the commission uh, address this issue? Thank you, Chairman Naller. Well, as you stated, there are four basic components of actors in declines of enslavement. That's the state and local governments and federal governments, corporations, institutions like universities, uh, the church, as well as individual families. And so all of those have to be brought under, under question when we go into a commission to study the harms in which uh, present day African-Americans face as a result of those atrocities. We know that uh, like in Chicago, there's a family, the McCormick family uh, that has a foundation. Uh, the McCormick family was made wealthy by a, an invention that was stolen from an African off their farm. It became the mechanical reaper, which freed millions of Americans from the farm and allowed them to go into industry. The McCormick family, uh, from which the McCormick Expo Theater is, is named after the largest expo center in America, they have an obligation. The, the commission will look at uh, these foundations, these corporations, these institutions, and will determine what within their, their ability do they owe in making sure that the gaps in wealth, the gaps in education, the gaps in housing and health uh, do not continue forward into the future? Uh, they have a responsibility. They have been enriched. Uh, the uh, endowments that they share and hold are a direct result of um, much of the uh, atrocities that has committed in the past. So the commission would definitely look into those other players uh, as well. And how would you... Uh... Uh, how do you think the commission uh, might deal with uh, groups like Asian Americans who have suffered uh, uh, discrimination over the years, like the Chinese Exclusion Act or the Japanese Exclusion Act and the internment of uh, Japanese uh, during World War II? Um, how do you think the commission could deal with that? Well, there's ancillary benefit uh, to the entire nation when reparations to African Americans are uh, are given, are, are uh, administered. And so uh, just like every uh, person who comes to America benefits from the prosperity that was built off of enslavement, every American also benefits from the struggles that African-Americans fought for our human and civil rights to be faced. If you look at women, if you look at um, the, the disabled, if you look at the immigrant, all of those people, no matter what protected class they're in, they benefit from the historical struggles of African Americans. And so this struggle to be repaired would also have ancillary benefits for the entire nation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see my time has expired. So I yield back. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much for your participation and your questions. Um, I now yield to Mr. McClintock. Uh, the gentleman from California for five minutes. Mr. McClintock. Sorry, how's that? There you are. Thank you very Thank much. You. you have five minutes. I, I listened to Chairman Cohen speaking extensively about the three fifths provision of the Constitution. I don't think he understands what the debate was all about. Ironically, he's taking the side of the southern states at the convention. They wanted a full count of every slave uh, that they held in order to add to their congressional representation. It was the anti-slavery states that objected. Uh, they argued that those who were held in bondage 
should not be counted at all in the apportionment of congressional seats, not because they were not human beings, but precisely because they were, and that the Constitution should not reward the slave states with representation in Congress while those states denied these people their freedom. So the three-fifths provision was not a statement that slaves were three-fifths of a person. It was a result of a compromise necessary to bring into existence our new nation as Lincoln said, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Uh, ironically, Stephen Douglas would uh, agree with the chairman's narrative that the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which gave them life, were only meant for white people. That's exactly the position that Stephen Douglas took. And of that position, Lincoln said this during their debate at all. He said, at Galesburg the other day, I said, in answer to Judge Douglas, that three years ago, there never had been a man, so far as I knew or believed, in the whole world who had said that the Declaration of Independence did not include Negroes in the term all men. I reassert it today. I assert that Judge Douglas and all his friends may search the whole records of the country, and it will be a matter of great astonishment to me if they shall be able to find that one human being three years ago had ever uttered the astounding sentiment that the term all men in the declaration did not include the Negro. I believe the first man who ever said it was Chief Justice Taney in the Dred Scott decision. And the next uh, to him was our friend Stephen A. Douglas. And now it's become a catchword of the entire party. And when this new principle, this new proposition that no human being ever thought of three years ago was brought forward, I combat it as having an evil tendency if not an evil design, end quote. In fact, in his, his Cooper Union speech a year and a half later, Lincoln systematically dismantled this argument by tracing the votes of every one of the American founders who consistently opposed slavery whenever the issue arose. Uh, he meticulously documented that their vision was of a nation of free men and women of all races and religions together enjoying the blessings of liberty and the equal protection of our laws. That vision was put in modern terms by Martin Luther King to express the gold standard of racial harmony, that we should be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. It is the equal protection of the law and the vision of the American founders, of Abraham Lincoln, of Martin Luther King, of a colorblind society that is now directly under attack by measures like this. I can't imagine a more divisive, polarizing, or unjust measure than one that would, by government force, require people who never owned slaves to pay reparations to those who never were slaves based not on anything they'd done, but because of what race they were born. Fortunately, we have a Constitution that forbids such an injustice. Some of, of those provisions were won by hundreds of thousands of Americans like my ancestor, James H. Ewing of the 3rd Iowa Volunteer uh, Infantry Regiment. He was 24 years old when he was killed on April 6, 1862 at Pittsburgh Landing on the first day of what became known as the Battle of Shiloh. In the words of his brother, James gave up his life at the Battle of Shiloh fighting to save our free government. Yes, there are racists in our society. There are racists of all colors in every society. It is the baser side of human nature. But no nation has struggled harder to transcend that nature and isolate and marginalize its racists than have Americans. Racism is the practice of according rights and privileges, not based on equality under the law, but rather according to what race a person was born. The measure before us today exemplifies that practice, and Lincoln was right. It is evil in both its tendency and its design. And with that, I'll uh, yield uh, to my friend Larry Elder for any closing thoughts he might have. Congressman, thank you so much. I agree with, of course, everything you said. And uh, Congressman Cohen did uh, completely butcher the three-fifths argument, and thank you for correcting the record. He also referred to uh, a civil rights warrior named Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was an acolyte of Martin Luther King, and Bayard, Bayard Rustin was both black and gay and did not support uh, race-based preferences. Uh, the Urban League uh, at the time was run by Whitney Young. And Whitney Young supported a 10-year period of time where he argued for a Marshall Plan for black people. Again, 10-year period of time. This was 1965, so it would have long since been over had the board approved it, but they didn't. 
One board member said, are you crazy? Here we are telling America to be fair, and you're telling, quote, us, you're telling Americans to, quote, hire Negroes just because they're Negroes, close quote. We oppose it. So this is completely divisive. And I want to quote somebody who once was asked about reparations, and he said this, and I'm quoting, it is easy to make that theoretical argument, but as a practical matter, it is hard to think of any society in human history in which a majority population has said that as a consequence of historic wrongs, we are now going to take a big chunk of that nation's resources over a long period of time to make that right, end of quote. He said, as a practical matter, it is virtually impossible to do. That gentleman was Barack Obama, and he was right. I also heard one of the witnesses refer to the belief that white people are superior uh, and their belief that black people are inferior. Well, they can believe what they want to believe, but the facts are that young black people have higher self-esteem than do young white people and much higher self-esteem than do young Asian people. So uh, if the argument is that uh, uh, historical discrimination and Jim Crow has somehow called blacks to think of themselves uh, as less than blacks, it ain't working. Blacks have higher self-esteem than virtually any other race uh, in America. Also, a couple of times the police have been hammered uh, let me just uh, mention that a few days ago, uh, a man was in his backyard minding his own business. Apparently, he fit the description the of the man. Time has expired. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. And now, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, recognize a new member of this committee, uh, an outstanding new member from North Carolina. I recognize generally Ms. Ross for five minutes. Uh Thank you so much, um, Representative Jackson Lee, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, I, I am from North Carolina, and I have a background working on civil rights issues here in North Carolina. And um, we've heard a lot today about the history of slavery, the history of racism. Um, I can tell you that um, our work is not done. Um, I want to give us a, a short shout out to North Carolina, though, because it is one of nine states that has issued a formal apology for uh, for slavery. And it's one of the states that in a bipartisan way has um, come up with reparations for forced sterilizations. Um, and so as we think about the history of racism and slavery in this country, we have to have a conversation about the truth of the past, about the harms that have been inflicted, and about the appropriate way for all of us to go forward. I don't believe that this particular resolution prescribes a way of going forward, but it's a conversation about what we need to do. And just as we did in North Carolina when we passed a bill compensating people for forced sterilization, a, a terrible, terrible chapter in our history that's not just in North Carolina's history. I think we need to think long and hard about how we address our history, how we address the harms, and how we can move forward together. There's been some divisiveness, um, you know, there's divisiveness throughout our country. There's a, a clear division of opinion. But I'd like to bring us together and think about what we can all agree on going forward. We've been able to do that in a couple of ways in North Carolina. We've been able to do that on racial profiling. We've been able to do that on innocence issues. And again, on compensation for forced sterilization. And so I'm hopeful that we will be able to do that as a congressional body too. And again, I thank Representative Jackson Lee for her leadership and for having us start this discussion in the 117th Congress. Thank you so much. Let me thank uh, Congresswoman Ross for recounting the history of North Carolina so eloquently uh, and bringing to our attention, of course, the forced sterilization and, in essence, the repairing of that heinous act uh, to the extent that individuals were compensated. Uh, let us be very clear. Uh, the Commission on H.R. 40 is a commission to fact-find 
uh, to repair, to restore, and develop proposals for reparations that, as Mr. Howard's testimony indicates, takes many, many perspectives. Thank you so very much. I want to make sure, is Mr. Jordan here? Thank you. Then uh, I will call on Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, you yielded for five minutes. Thank you so very much. Thank you Glad for doing here. that. Thank you. And I, I appreciate um, all the witnesses time today and, and also uh, for Mr. Uh, Burgess Owens for standing in for me. I've had intermittent internet and uh, power here in Louisiana as y'all have in Texas. Uh, a couple of questions real quick. Uh, Mr. Herschel Walker, um, has not had an opportunity to um, speak up here in the last uh, part of this hearing. If he's still with us, I just wanted to um, pitch it to him and give him an opportunity to see if there was anything that has been said so far last couple of hours here that, that he wanted to uh, respond to. Ms. Walker. Uh, yes, I like to respond and, and I, I want to thank Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, I like to ask, uh, do she know the the or the year of those pictures? And the reason I ask that is I, uh, whenever I get on a subject, I do facts finding myself. And one of the things I looked up and I asked my mom is how many um, African American was alive today that was in slavery, which is none. So I go to some of the older people for experience. And I remember my mom mentioning, how could we pay for your great, great grandfather being burned to death? Or how could you pay for your great great uncle being hung? And I understand that those pictures are horrible, but right now I think the facts found is going to be very difficult to to go back over history when history is not even taught in school on what we're trying to facts find. And that's what I think is so difficult because as I was looking up um reparation which i've been doing for the last year is it, it is very very difficult to find facts on different things of uh the african-american history and i think that's what's going to be very difficult in what we're doing right now i appreciate that response let me ask you i, I know you're passionate about this and you give a lot of motivational speeches to young people and all that or are, are there better ways that, that you think to uplift minority communities and provide opportunities for success than this idea of direct payments of, of taxpayer dollars? I mean, just in general, what do you say to young people to, to inspire them in that way? Well, one of the things I say to young people to inspire them is, first of all, and I say, you know, the hard truth is, and, and I say this, and I don't mean to offend anyone, I, but I say the African-American community have to come together as a group to take care of our own. That's one of the biggest problems we have. We will not take care of our own. You know, I said we cannot, as myself, uh, who grew up in South Georgia, uh, leave that community and leave all the African-American kids behind without inspiring them that they can be me. And I think we, the way we do this is we get back to uh, remembering where we came from. And you have to be responsible. You know, a lot of things we mentioned today, no one talked about responsibility. You know, I, I'm from the deep South. I know about racism. And uh, a matter of fact, uh, you know, we talked about the health, you know, everyone think I'm healthy, but I was diagnosed at one time as mentally unhealthy. It because of being bullied as a little kid, because of my weight, because of my speech, but uh, the things that happened to me was dealing with race. And I overcame through education, which is one of the major things that I talk to the young people today is education is more important than anything in life. Because when you educate yourself, you're able to see the truth for yourself. And I'm not saying that, that I think HR 40 is absolutely incredible, but I think to just say it's a facts founding is uh, is very difficult, and and uh, you know uh, facts founding of reparation, I think this is a little bit uh, I'm I'm confused at the at the two right now. 
Very good. I got I got 34 seconds left. Let me uh, turn to Mr. Elder real quick. You you, you touched on and, and began to explain the difference between equal rights and equal results. And I think a lot of people are confused about that. I just wonder in the last 20 seconds or so, you want to articulate a little bit more about the difference between the two. Well, it, it's, it's really about what Herschel Walker just now said. It's about personal responsibility. Uh, there are think tanks on the left, like the Brookings Institution, the think tanks on the right, like the American Enterprise Institute, and they agree that the way to escape poverty is to do a handful of things. Number one, finish high school. Number two, don't have a kid until you get married. Number three, get a job, keep a job, and don't quit that job until you get another job. And number four, avoid the criminal justice system. And they don't say that this formula only applies to you if you're white. They say this formula applies to anybody. Very good. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so very much. Your time has expired. Um, I think uh, to Mr. Walker and Attorney Elder, that is exactly what HR 40 is, to delve into the facts, to connect the history. Uh, and I'd only say that there is something to the heinous, vile, and vicious act of slavery that uh, the descendants of enslaved Africans and those slaves experienced uniquely in this country. We are grateful that we have 300 organizations that are supporting that concept, but the fact finding of HR 40 is just what uh, is uh, its task uh, to respond to the concerns that have been expressed. I'd ask unanimous consent to submit into the record uh, the letter from the LCCR, and we thank them for that letter. Uh, I'm delighted now to recognize Mr. Johnson for five minutes, the gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Johnson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank the gentle lady for uh, the time and for the introduction of this very important legislation. And to my friend, uh, Tom McClintock, who has a revisionist understanding of the three fifths compromise, I would want to set the record straight that um, the three fifths compromise was a way of counting slaves for purposes of apportioning how many seats in the US House of Representatives the southern states would get. And of course, those three fifths of human beings did not have the rights of human beings. They were just counted for purposes of human beings. But even then, it was a discount, three fifths. And they were treated as slaves even less than three fifths of a person. And to my friend, uh, Mr. McClintock, uh, I'm so happy that you can track your uh, forebearers all the way back and beyond probably 1861. But that was at a point where our black families had been torn apart. We can't go back. I can't go back and uh, trace the lineage of my family further than about eight, uh, the, the 1880s. And even then it is um, uh, not certain. Uh, so you are so fortunate as a white male to be able to track your people all the way back probably into the 1700s, maybe even uh, earlier than that. And you have no idea how hurtful it is for the black psyche to not have a sense of our history further back than, uh, than it is reported by white folks who get it wrong to keep us uh, uh, misunderstanding of our value uh, to society. And, uh, you know, I mean, I can't express to you the psychological wounds that still exist uh, that HR 40 would help to get at. Attorney Elder, in your response to a question from Congressman Owens, you mentioned Professor Gates at uh, Harvard University. So I assume that you're familiar with Professor Charles Ogletree, the esteemed African-American professor at Harvard Law School, are you not? You familiar with him? I'm aware of who he is, yes. And Professor Ogletree is a prominent advocate for reparation. And he has stated, quote, the reparation movement should not focus on payments to individuals. The damage has been done to a group but the damage has not been done equally within the group. The movement must therefore focused on the poorest of the poor, 
it must finance social recovery for the bottom stuck, providing an opportunity to address comprehensively the problems of those who have not substantially benefited from integration or affirmative action. Uh, my question, Attorney Elder, do you agree that there are black folks in America who are stuck at the bottom due to the legacy of racism, slavery, and Jim Crow, and that America should take affirmative action to address employment, health care, housing, and educational disparities that plague our people this day? Uh, Congressman Johnson, thank you very much for the question. Obviously, there are black people who are poor. The extent to which uh, the poverty is a result of slavery and Jim Crow is tenuous at best. The larger factor behind black poverty is the absence of fathers in the home, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, okay well, let me stop you right there, because I do understand. And um, Mr. Howard, uh, what is your response to my question? Well, certainly there's a direct contribution, a uh, direct connection. As Mr. Elder talked about fatherless homes, we see that it was a an Illinois Transatlantic Slave Trade Commission, the only slave trade commission in the country in 2005. And the economist Linwood Tahid stated that black he found out that black uh, men married at the same rate as white men, uh, at the same rate of Hispanic men, and the rate in which they married was determined by their labor force participation. So where you had 90% labor force participation, the marriage rate would would be anywhere from eight to 15 points below the labor force participation. So when you come forward to, America, to, to now, where you have less than 50% labor force participation among Blacks because of this discrimination, because of the racism, because of the separate development, the apartheid of, of Jim Crow, you have this 50% labor force participation in major cities in America, you're going to have a 15 to 8% lag in two-parent families. And that's exactly what you have. So when Mr. Elder talks about the fatherless homes uh, and uh, the, the destruction of Black families, it's directly related to the inherent anti-Blackness that, that this country is built upon and that uh, we still suffer from today and what HR 40 must ad uh, address. Thank you, uh, Professor Achiome. A recent Harvard study suggests that reparation could provide health benefits for not only Black Americans, but for the entire nation. How can reparation eliminate health disparities among Black Americans? And uh, what would these remedies look like? Thank you very much for your question. And I think this is why the um, bill is so important is because it provides an opportunity to study exactly answers to questions such as that and to draw on comparative experiences of other countries. So for example, um, Colombia had one of the most ambitious reparations program, um, programs that we're aware of in different parts of the country. And part of that reparations program included providing health care to people who had suffered extreme human rights violations. So I would say reparations can play a role in addressing health disparities because they are about undoing structures of injustice, including structures of racial injustice that produce um, health disparities. Um, but I would say that in terms of the concrete solutions that would be relevant in the United States, um, the most advisable thing would be to pursue exactly what I think this bill is, is trying to push for, which is um, an in-depth study that would allow for responses that would be tailored to different local um, contexts. Thank you. Uh... Mr. Walker, does it surprise you to learn that HR 40 does not include a proposal to make cash payments to black people in America? Well, I never thought HR 40 when I read was just uh, about the payment to black America. I, well, that's uh, what said, you said in your uh, statement. Uh, yes, I said that was part of it in my statement, but I also say education, which in the past, we've not taught Black America giving them a good education, which in Mrs. Uh, Jackson Lee uh, spoke, uh, this is a facts founder, which is one of the questions I put within my statement, that payment is just one part of what reparation is. 
and its education. Well, it, it is. It is. It, it is not. Uh, point, point, order, point, order, point of order. Point of order. Point of order. Black people. Uh, point of order. That, uh, I'll yield back. I'm, I'm out of time. Gentleman's time has expired. Is Mr. Let me um, call on the next member. Uh, is Mr. Roy present? Ms. Fishback? Yes, Madam Chair. Ms. Can Fishback? Yes. Uh, Ms. Fishback, yes. you'll recognize uh, the general lady from Minnesota is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. And I would Thank like you. to build my to uh, Congressman Owens for whichever, however much he may use. Uh, uh, and I'd, I'd like to uh, Mr. Thank Owens you so much. from Utah is, uh, and I stand corrected, I think I might have said Colorado earlier, Mr. Um, Owens, those are beautiful states, but I know you want to be from Utah and you're recognized <laughs> for the time the gentleman lady has yielded to you for five thank minutes. You, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I would like to uh, just uh, ask uh, uh, Mr. Elder if he has any, any comments to say, the response to Representative uh, Hank Johnson's question that uh, he had asked earlier. I'd like to, to uh, uh, continue this conversation about that. I, I do. Uh, we've been talking about uh, disparate outcomes as if the disparate outcomes by definition mean racism. There was a young attorney named Barack Obama who joined with other attorneys to file a class action lawsuit against Citibank some years ago. Uh, and as a result of the class action lawsuit, the Citibank agreed to, uh, to grant mortgages to 186 people who had applied, turned down, and the, uh, and the applicants argued that they were turned down because they were black. Well, they got the loans and virtually nobody was able to keep up with the loans. Many of them went into default, which indicated that the bank was not discriminating against these would-be black borrowers. Also, studies have found that community black banks often have a higher turn down rate for would-be borrowers than the majority banks because they are more thinly capitalized. So just because something has a disparate outcome does not mean that that outcome was a result of racism. We've also talked a lot about the police officers. A few days ago, as I started to say, uh, a man was in the backyard of his, yard, of his uh, own house, a uh, match description of a suspect who was running on foot, police officer chasing, mistook the homeowner for the suspect, shot and killed him. <clears throat> I doubt that very many people you know about this, and the reason you don't know about it is because the cop uh, who shot the suspect was white. The suspect was white. This took place in Idaho. Therefore, nobody gave a rip. But I assure you, if this had been a black suspect and a white cop, we'd know his name. The fact is, there are more unarmed white people killed every year by the police than unarmed blacks. The media couldn't care less. CNN couldn't care less, giving black people the false impression that the police are mowing down black people just because they are black. It is true that the police are two and a half times more likely to kill a black suspect. It is also true that a young black man is anywhere from seven to 10 times more likely to be a victim of a homicide, almost always at the victim at the hands of another young black man. That's why the cops are there. The idea that there's systemic racism against black people is a lie. And when it came to the election, uh, the defenders of Biden were arguing, where is the widespread evidence of voter fraud? A fair question. Where is the wide, forget about widespread, where is the evidence of police brutality against black people? If anything, the evidence shows the police are more hesitant, more reluctant to pull the trigger on a black suspect than a white suspect. It is a fraud, it is a con that is pushed upon this country, and we need to stop it. Thank you. I, to go to Mr. Walker, uh, uh, what is the message that you will give today uh, to a young, young black boys and girls that's different? Than the uh, the message that uh, that you received as you were coming up in the, in, the, in, the, in the the days of uh, uh, true racism back in Georgia, Mr. Walker. The message I would give today is responsibility. You have to be responsible. And that's one thing that I learned from my parents is responsibility. And to get back. Hey, Bobby, do you yield back? So, so, sorry, so one second. Someone has someone has to mute. Thanks, thanks. And now we will go to Colin. Can somebody please mute Thank your... You, uh, and you I want to preface this by saying that uh, some of y'all have more experience uh, okay. going through this process Is that Mike? Uh, in terms of redistricting than I could ever have. Uh, okay. I, have I don't know how, if there's anything we do about that, guys. To mute the background. Uh, uh, it sounds like there's some crosswalkers. It sounds like another hearing. I want to just briefly just... discuss why okay. I think we need both Okay. Protections in HR one. Right, Chairman, is there, is there anything we can do about that, or we just kind of uh -huh. kind of wade through it? Okay. Uh, it looks like caught it now. Go ahead. Okay. Good. All right. Go, ahead, Mr. Walker. I'm sorry. Please continue, Mr. Walker. Did we lose him? 
I'm okay. going to jump in uh, here for a minute. I've been on the hearing and I appreciate Ms. Jackson Lee chairing. Just, I haven't kept up with the time. Where are we on the time on Mr. Owens? Does, can staff tell us? So Mr. Owens, do you know I don't have a timer? Yeah, one minute I, I and three, one minute, Mr. Chairman, and three seconds. All right, Mr. Owens, continue. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, let me let me just uh, cause I, is, is uh, Mr. Walker still there? If not, I'll I'll just uh, give back my time to. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, yes, I'm here. Okay. But please please finish up. You well, have about I a minute. Go back so to Ms. Jackson Lee. Comments. I go back to Ms. Jackson Lee. Said that we're in a fight family, and I go now to as Representative Johnson was speaking. Uh, Fikes founding is where is the education for African American? At the same time, are uh, we Fikes founding of why there are serious black on black crime? Because within my neighborhood, uh, where I grew up, I don't experience that in Wrightsville, Georgia, but in Atlanta, Georgia, or in other large cities, that's one of the Fikes that I would love to solve to stop the black on black crime. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owens, and uh, thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee, for chairing the committee while I was gone. We had an organizing committee meeting of natural resources, and if you don't get there and get to pick your committees, you're shut out for two years. But I've listened to most of the committee uh, at the same time, uh, and I, so I've listened to Mr. Elder, and I've listened to Mr. Walker, and listened to Congressman McClintock and all, and I appreciate uh, the testimony, and thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. I think Ms. Garcia is next. Ms. Garcia, from your motel room, you're recognized. Actually, sure, it's a hotel. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, the best part is it, it, it is heated, and I do have power here at this hotel. No water, though. Uh, but thank you for, uh, again, for holding this very important hearing. Uh, and thank you to all the witnesses who've taken the time to come up here today. I'm a very proud, and I'm going to repeat that, proud original co-sponsor of HR 40, because it's important that our nation heals by finding the facts, understanding the lingering effects of slavery in the United States, and finding solutions, finding solutions through real conversation and dialogue and for finding successful reparation programs. Uh, I want to repeat what Mr. Johnson uh, mentioned earlier. There's nothing in this bill that talks about payments of checks or money to anyone. This is a commission to find the facts and bring us to full healing. Uh, HR 40 is a good first step. And I want to personally thank my colleague and fellow Houstonian, Sheila Jackson Lee, for bringing this bill forward and to working together with all of us uh, to make sure that this can come to fruition. I also applaud the Biden-Harris administration for continuing, continuing to outline its vision for advancing racial equality for all Americans who just want to live and breathe without fear. I, like many Americans and people around the world, witnessed a tumultuous period last year of civil unrest and racial injustice. Well, I am proud to have joined my judiciary colleagues to swiftly pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act it is clear that much more work needs to be done. Without question, history has taught us time and time again that our lives, our laws must boldly affirm that black lives matter. History has also taught us that we are stronger when we unite. But to do so, we must first learn, educate, and, and eliminate the root causes of racial discrimination in order to form a more perfect union. We cannot keep ignoring this as a country. We must act, and I urge everyone to support this bill. I want to also uh, want to reemphasize uh, something that uh, Ms. Uh, Masako uh, mentioned in her testimony, and I want to start my questions with her. She says in her written testimony that this would be a first step to justice and it would be also a first step for healing. It's interconnected, is it not, uh, Ms. Masoko? Yes, I, I think we didn't quite realize at the time how important the commission was for Japanese Americans in 1981, because we really didn't know about the camp experience. We, we didn't hear the stories from our parents. So for the people, as I said, to actually share their pain and their experiences, and for us, their children, 
to hear what they had to say and continue to hear what they had to say. It was a process. It was a process that, uh, you know, our, our community doesn't like to speak about pain. They didn't want those things to be brought out, but they did. And it was, it, we're still actually working on healing as a community, even, uh, you know, 40 years later from that, it opened the door and, and it helped uh, us to understand what happened and why, why things, why our parents were the way they were, why we felt the way we did about ourselves and why our children may also feel the way they do. So yes, it was a first step towards healing. Well, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Weber, uh, in the terms of the California Commission, uh, you, you say in your written testimony uh, that you can't wait till the federal government does what we need to do. So California now has their bill in place. Uh, do you think that other states need to do that to help build a bigger groundswell of support? Or do you think that both can work in parallel? I think they can work parallel uh, as we plan to do with with regards to the federal bill. Um, but we no state should be held back because the feds have not moved forward. They, it, this has been a very long journey of 40 years of trying to get this bill passed, H.R. 40, uh, and through Congress. And you're a much larger in, institution with a tremendously diverse population and, and being represented. In California, we had really no opposition to uh, have forming a reparations commission. In fact, we had bipartisan support for it, and uh, and we've gotten overwhelming support from organizations and others who are eager for us to have the conversation about um, uh, reparations, about the history of California, California's role in enslavement, and to begin to talk about uh, uh, addressing a lot of the issues that we face. Uh, we recognize the fact in California that um, that slavery in itself has had been has been so insidious that it has sometimes created issues. And we mentioned that with the George Floyd issue in California, that because of what had happened with the lynchings and the burnings, we had pretty much seared the conscience of white America when it comes to the pain of African-Americans. And we have to basically recognize that fact that we can actually see, see harm done, see the devastation, and not really respond to it as we do to other groups. Uh, you know, we, I listened to the colleagues talk about unemployment and the unemployment statistics and how it's gone down. Well, anything that's large, when it moves, is going to have a greater percentage of movement than something that is small. So if you've got unemployment of three, four, five percent in your state, and we have always had double digit unemployment uh, of African Americans in this country, well, when it moves, it's gonna look significant. It's gonna look like a 50% drop, yet it's still a double digit unemployment that's there and an injustice that continues as we recognize in California. So. Um, we, we plan to move forward. We are moving forward. I shouldn't say we plan to. We are moving forward. We hope that at some point what we do will be will it be informative to the federal government. But if obviously if the federal government decides that it's going to do this, we hope to be able to, to complement it with what is happening in California. Because California is so far away from the South, we think that it doesn't have an impact. And yet it really does. Thank you. And I see my time is up. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Uh, our, our next... Uh, uh, panelist is, is Corey Bush. Representative Bush, you're recognized for five minutes. All right. Uh, St. Louis, and I thank you, Chairman Coleman, uh, Cohen, for convening this important hearing. And I um, want to say thank you to the leadership of um, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee on this. I really appreciate you. Um, I come as one, but I speak as many. I bring with me today my family. James E. Bush, Vera Bush Whitley, Ulysses Blakeney, Clifton Blakeney, and generations of Black men and women who have labored on this land, who have fought for this country, and to whom our country is deeply indebted. My story is a story of survival. It is a story of my ancestors who were enslaved in Mississippi and South Carolina. It is a story of the great migration, the mass migration of 6 million African Americans out of the rural South. When white farmers traveled to the West in search of land, they were granted 160 acres of free land through the Homestead Act. My family was denied the promise, denied the promise of 40 acres and a mule in the aftermath of the Civil War and the start of, of Reconstruction. 
My story is the story of a great grandfather who, who served this country in World War I and a grandfather who served this country in World War II only to be discarded by their government as they suffered through trauma and the wounds of war. When white soldiers came back from fighting abroad, they were given housing preferences and education subsidies. My grandfathers, Ulysses and Clifton Blakeney, were denied those benefits. My story is a story of men and women who fled violence, who were stripped of their rights and protections, who were left out of GI bills and New Deal subsidies. The violence my family withstood from one generation to the next was not isolated. It was systemic, it was structural, it was political, backed by legislation passed by this very body to deny descendants of enslaved people economic and social opportunity. Underlying the generational trauma and exploitation is a government that abandoned its role to protect its own citizens, a government that refused to even acknowledge the humanity of my ancestors, a government that to this day refuses to acknowledge or atone for the wrongdoings of white supremacist violence. The federal government must account for its ongoing role in perpetuating, supporting, and upholding white supremacy. Secretary Weber, as you mentioned, state governments and in some instances, private institutions unjustly profited from the unpaid labor of descendants of enslaved people. Why is it still necessary for the federal government to play a central role in restoring the harm of slavery and its aftermath? And what can the federal government learn from states efforts? Well, clearly the federal government oftentimes protects the laws in the various states that have been put forth. The, you have the ultimate authority to determine the legality and uh, uh, of, of issues that are there. So oftentimes we appeal to the, to the federal courts and obviously have those courts reject the issues and therefore perpetuate the kind of injustices that do continue to exist. Uh, the federal government has a, a significant role. The laws that were created in this land and endorsed by the Supreme Court, the, the separate but equal laws, uh, all of those things actually enforce the kind of treatment and racism that exists. The refusal to basically try individuals who had engaged in, 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 uh, in lynching in this country, the violation of people's human rights. You have whole books with pictures of people who lynched individuals face forward, uh, looking at you, knowing who they were, and no one has ever been tried for any of the lynchings found in the books that we have, enormous books on an, uh, without sanctuary, where every example is, is an example of lynching that occurred face forward, where people who took pride and made postcards out of lynching that existed. And as a result, no one has ever been tried for any of those lynchings that were there. And of course, so, so when we look at it, the federal government has a significant role to play. We hope that when we look at the things that are there, like the insurance industry is regulated by the federal government, it's regulated by states, but also by the federal government. And so it condones the behavior and the, the uh, discriminatory practices that existed in the various states. Uh, we hope in California to be able to demonstrate not only an ability to look at the injustices, to see what has occurred, but also to fashion a, 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 um, a response to it that is deeper and long term. And as pointed out, uh, we've never talked about money, uh, but obviously money is in everything. And it's not about giving money. It's about making sure right. that the right. programs that exist basically can effectively address this long-standing situation that, it's, that has been in African-American life. And so the federal government has a significant role to play. And we hope in, our, in the state that we will do our part as a state, as a large state with, with resources to begin to address the issue. But, uh, but others should also be looking carefully at themselves. And surely that we hope that the federal government will support the efforts and the recommendations we make concerning what that state should do and maybe even what should, the role the federal government should play in assisting the state in accomplishing its goals. That's my time. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Representative Bush. Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes. And uh, first, I want to say that uh, when I mentioned earlier in, in my testimony, my first uh, five minutes, uh, uh, I mentioned seeing these movies that were uh, Chadwick Boseman's movies. And I mentioned the one about Thurgood Marshall and how awful Thurgood Marshall was treated by racists and and his uh, legal uh, partner, Mr. Friedman, by anti-Semites. I thought about it, and I missed the main point of the movie. Uh, the defendant in the case was treated the worst of all. He was illegally charged with rape because it was a he was a, an African-American worker for a prominent socialite woman 
in which they had consensual sex. But for an insightful moment by Thurgood Marshall, he would have been probably sentenced to death. And that happened so many times in our country's history. But for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund of Thurgood Marshall, which should have been the cause of the United States government and the Justice Department, but it wasn't. The Justice Department for African Americans was Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, Mr. Hillary Shelton of the NAACP, I want to ask you a question. We had Mr. Uh, uh, Tanahishi Coates uh, testify in our last hearing, and he, he said at that hearing, uh, 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of racist housing policies. Until we reckon with our compounding moral debts, America will never be whole. Yet many of my colleagues across the aisle agree with the sentiment captured in remarks by Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who said, quote, I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago from none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. And we tried to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing landmark civil rights legislation. We elected an African-American president who he tried to defeat from day one. My own response to Mr. McConnell's remarks is that African Americans have had to struggle to obtain what for others has been unquestionably understood as a God given right. Just like Ms. Bush mentioned, when her ancestors came home from the war, they didn't get things that were given to white men who fought for our country and women who fought for our country, white veterans. African Americans didn't get that. Uh, they, they, they were God given rights to everybody else, but not for African Americans. They had to depend on legal actions and, and protests. And, and legislation. Uh, in light of that argument, did social and economic discrimination, Mr. Shelton, against African Americans abruptly end with the Civil War or abruptly end with the civil rights legislation passage or with the election of Barack Obama? Why should federal or state governments bear any responsibility for the economic and social damages imposed on des descendants of the enslaved, Mr. Shelton? Is Mr. Shelton not with us? If not, I will answer my own question. It did not end with the Civil War. It did not end with the with Baker v. V. Carr. It did not end with Republicans like Everett Dirksen and Charles Percy and William Schaefer and Nelson Rockefeller and Wayne Morse and George Romney. It did not end. It continues. It continues to this day. Discrimination against people in economic terms, in social terms, with health deserts and food deserts and people who don't care. Benign neglect, at best, it can be said. Uh, the, the fact is, uh, we have a problem in this country and we need to deal with it. And we need to, to make amends. And reparations is not necessarily money, as Mr. Johnson pointed out. It's a study. And it's not just slavery, which some of the witnesses have talked about. Nobody here alive. There's no slaves alive. It's about slavery and the consequences of slavery. It's about Jim Crow and what happened through Jim Crow and separate and unequal, Plessy versus Ferguson that bled into this country's core and was not challenged by most people. I, I have, the, the, I've seen it when I was a young person in, 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 in Memphis. I saw discrimination and I, I couldn't understand it. Uh, the, the first hero I had was an African Cuban baseball player, Minnie Minosa, who befriended me when nobody else did, when I had polio and was on crutches and trying to get autographs at a ball game. And he befriended me. And I went to my dad. I was just six years old. The nicest guy, the only guy that put his hands hard out to me was the, was the black player, the only one. And people didn't get it. And it's been for years. We have a problem in this country, which we need to study. As Charles Ogletree said, it could be programs that are good for people beyond black people, but other people who have been systematically oppressed or not given opportunities. And we should not fear a study. And it does not deal with uh, simply with slavery. It deals with the, res the after effects of slavery and what's that done to the American society and the American soul. And as far as what I said about the three-fifths compromise, I was right. It was using black people for the political power of Southerners who wanted to have that power, mostly to keep slavery legal. So they were having their 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 use was being perpetuated against them in the halls of Congress to keep slavery and keep them in, in bondage. And so, yes, we needed a war because the South left the country over slavery. 
And that's exactly what happened. And we're still dealing with it. And we need to have a study on what we can do to give people a proper share at the table. Uh, it, in football terms, it's like getting to the, to, the, to the three yard line and you think you got a chance to score. The, the white team is on the three yard line. They're in the red zone all the time. The black team has been for years back on the other three yard line with 97 yards to go and nobody cared and they got to play with inferior uniforms they got to play without helmets and they got to play without technological advances to have coaches up in the stands to tell them what to do but they were on the three yard line and they want to keep them there and the other team had helmets and shoulder pads and all kind of walkie talkies to know what the other team was planning to do and keep them on the three yard line. And we want to say it's all equal. Let's just go to the, it's all fair. Let's just start now. You can't do that. It's patently unfair. With that, I want to yield the remainder of my time and whatever other time okay. she needs to, to, to um, Congressman Sheila Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, um, I think you have eloquently crafted what we're doing today. I wanted to personally thank each and every witness for their stupendous testimony. H.R. 40 is large enough uh, and right enough to be able to hear from Mr. Walker uh, and Attorney Elder. It will be able to hear from a uh, potpourri of voices. That is what H.R. 40, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals, uh, is all about. And so I want to be able to try to capture Mr. Chairman uh, where we are going and why it's important to go. Thank you for the historical perspective of Mr. Johnson and yourself about the three fifths. Might I add one other point? The three fifths was in the constitution. Was any other race of people listed as three fifths in the constitutional document? So when this precious document was formulated that has given us this wonderment of democracy, then we, descendants of enslaved Africans, were not a whole person. And the reason, of course, is the North didn't want the South to oversee them with members in the United States Congress. It seems interesting that we're facing that aggravation even today. But let me give you these stark points so that you can understand when I held up the pictures of those who had been hung. It is the very point that we're making. They were in the late 1800s and in the 20th century. That is the concept of which HR 40 is based on, the continuing disparities and violence against African-Americans and other indigenous people. And when a question was asked about other people, I know from my grandmother, when you lift one boat, you lift all boats. My father, Ezra Jackson, was the baby son of my widow grandmother, three uncles went to World War II. I can assure you when they came back, they did not have access to the GI Bill. They were redlined. They frankly went home to live with mother. The youngest son was a brilliant cartoonist, an artist. He was asked to work for the major cartoons comics on Madison Avenue in New York. But when the white soldiers came home, this young man was relieved of his dream and never again for another 30 years was able to work back in that industry. He was summarily fired because of his skin color. And so HR 40 is the presence of the continuing sting of disparities. It is the evidence of the fact that school populations of black and brown children received $23 billion less in funding than white school districts. It is the evidence that end of life care for black Americans is 7,100 more expensive dollars, more expensive for black individuals. It is the fact uh, uh, that black people are more than six times as likely as white people to languish behind bars for possessing drugs for personal use, even though black and white people use drugs the same in fact, the concept of mass incarceration was on the backs of black men and women in the state and federal prisons. So I just I want to raise this question uh, with uh, Ms. Masoki, because we thank the Japanese Americans 
for their strong support of H.R. 40. We apologize to them for the unnatural internment that they faced in the 1940s of patriotic Japanese Americans. We have received 300 letters from Japanese Americans in support of H.R. 40. We are aware of the fact uh, that Japanese Americans under a Republican president had the Civil Liberties Act, which was signed into law by President Reagan and received a reparation. Would you share with us the fact that this legislation, H.R. 40, if I might use the term, is mainstream and is relevant to today as it was relevant to you and the Japanese Americans in 1988, shortly thereafter John Conyers introduced this bill. And I'm glad in his leaving the Congress, he was kind enough to pass to me his legacy and ask me to carry this bill. Ms. Masoki, if I've got it right, would you share with that point about the support of Japanese Americans and these 300 letters and the uh, the feeling that you came over you in 1988 to receive the Civil Liberties Act signed by a Republican president? I, I think that our, our community mobilized very quickly to um, submit those 300 letters. And I am really proud of our community because I think we understood and understand the lesson of, of, of redress and of the Civil Liberties Act and that is solidarity with others. And to communicate the fact that you said, yes, it is mainstream. We won redress in 1988, and we didn't think we could, but we did with support of the whole country, enough to pass. And uh, you know, we thank the African-American community and other communities who came in solidarity with us. But this government paid redress out of its treasury to people that were victimized in 1942. So it is, it is something that can be done and should be done. Uh, and you know, we, we wholeheartedly support HR 40 and want to continue to support and see that it passes because it's such a, for the passage of Civil Liberties Act of 1988 meant a lot to our community. It meant that we could hold our head up high to say that our government apologized, made rest, was accountable and that we were not, it was an injustice It acknowledged that and continue to educate people today around that injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Let me have my last question to Ms. Heath. The Harvard study has reaffirmed uh, the fact that documented, peer-reviewed document that indicated uh, that in fact, if reparations had been implemented before COVID-19, uh, we might not have had this definitive and deadening and deadly imbalance. And so we know that the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, Black people get COVID-19 at a rate nearly one and a half times higher than that of white, are hospitalized at a rate of four times higher, and three times are likely to die from the disease. And so I would be interested, uh, Ms. Heath, uh, in how might the commission assess the impact of poor water poor sanitation, healthcare infrastructure on African-American committees, uh, excuse me, communities, and should there be a focus on environmental and health impacts on children? As you speak, I just want to, again, hold up the back of a slave uh, that was brutally beaten uh, by uh, his master. Uh, and so, that pain, that brutality continues. Ms. Heath, would you answer that question, please? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. And thank you for citing and lifting up the Harvard um, Medical Research's um, study that reveals if reparations you know, were administered, uh, the gaps of infection as well as deaths would have been closed uh, for uh, the Black community, but more broadly uh, for the U.S. And I think that speaks largely to this message of slavery and the denial of health care, um, which came, you know, in the institution of slavery, but thereafter in the form of other um, federal policies, uh, segregationist policies, such as redlining, um, which happened in 239 cities across the U.S., uh, which basically... Uh, divided communities along race and class lines and, and made those resources um, 
historically have been disinvested in, in those communities, particularly low income and black neighborhoods. Um, so we absolutely need to look at uh, healthcare specific reparations uh, remedies. Uh, as, as you know, you know, the same disease is going around and affecting all of us, but some of us are dying and being affected more. Um, and that means we're looking at life expectancy rates within the US and uh, being four, um, black people being four years um, less likely to live. Um, there's also um, rates of asthma, heat stroke, um, diabetes, obesity, uh, maternal health care, access to, to prenatal care that would help um, would help assist in terms of preventing preventable diseases and preventable deaths. And, right. and so that's why we need health care uh, reparations specific because black people are living in poor neighborhoods. Um, attending lower uh, lower resource schools, as well as um, lower um, high lower quality healthcare facilities and hospitals um, with higher rates of ambulance use, um, because there's no um, access to a broad range of practitioners that are dealing with these these healthcare issues. Um, so there's going to have to be a wide range of look at at and discrimination as a result of uh, several government uh, federal policies. Uh, point, point of order, point of order. Uh, the general lady from Texas going over time, wherever time is possible, I get uh, two minutes to conclude also. Yeah, Mr. Um, Mr. Cohen, Chairman Cohen, I, I, um, yeah, I'm, I've yeah. got a, a, a menagerie of, of devices here, but Mr. Owens, you'll be recognized for two minutes afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so Ms. much. Mr. Lee, are you about finished? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, Mr. Howard wanted to comment. Would you be kind enough to indulge Mr. Howard who wanted to comment? Uh, I will indulge time, you. I will yeah. indulge you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you. And I know Mr. Owens will have his time as a ranking member. Mr. Howard, may I uh, pose to you a question? Uh, that uh, responds directly to the picture that I'm holding of a uh, brutalized uh, slave uh, who shows the webs of uh, the beating of their master and use you know, the term that I use that that was uh, the terminology that a slave was subjected to. They were the slave and then they were the masters. And that's what we had here in this country of which we have never received an apology or a response. I want to yield to you and say, um, we're not asking our neighbors to do anything. We're saying to the federal government uh, that it was sanctioned. This is a legal commission to go through legal process of how we address these issues. But would you just address this? And then I will close. Mr. Howard, you wanna address this now? Thank you, Congressman uh, uh, Jackson Lee. Uh, that picture, most people may have seen that picture and some may have not, but that picture is a picture of a, a man by the name of Gordon. Gordon received that beating uh, at the time of the Civil War. And after he healed, he escaped enslavement and found his way to a Union Army camp. And it was there at that Union Army camp where that picture was taken after his examination to be enlisted into the Union Army to fight for the freedom of four million other of his enslaved brothers and sisters who were uh, enshackled in America. And after joining the Union Army, Gordon went out on patrol and was beaten a second time and left for dead, but found his way back again to the Union Army and participated in one of the first major, in one of the, the first major battle in Louisiana that was won by Black Union soldiers. So it's in that spirit that we continue the struggle to be repaired today in the spirit of Gordon. And I just wanted to lift up his name. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. And let me conclude my remarks by thanking Secretary Weber uh, Professor Ashumi, uh, Mr. Howard, Mr. Masuki, uh, Ms. Heath, and Mr. Shelton, and conclude my remarks with these simple statements. We have a wonderful group of members. I want to acknowledge Congresswoman Bush in my closing remarks, and the reason is because she had great experience in Ferguson. I went there when Michael Brown was brutally killed and racially profiled. It wasn't in 1855. It wasn't in 1822. It wasn't in 1799. It wasn't even uh, in uh, the 1950s. It was in the 21st century. 
Mr. Brown was racially profiled, a young man headed to college playing football, racially profiled. But when we pierced the veil of that city, Ferguson, we found out that the whole community had been racially profiled. The whole city was basing its income, uh, its, its revenue on fines and fees from African Americans, continuing disparities, and I say continuing remnants of slavery. So I thank Congresswoman Bush for her leadership in that fight. Uh, I'm glad she is here, but that is a very prime example of what continues to happen in the 21st century. I believe good Americans, and they are everywhere. This is a good country. It is a special country. It is a country that loves democracy, will welcome HR 40 and the healing reparative aspects of this commission. And so the final question to all of us is why we can't wait. And Robert F. Kennedy asked the question when he was asked, when people ask me why, I ask why not. That is what we're saying today. When people ask us why, I say why not. And when they ask us what time, I say why we can't wait. I'm Thank delighted you. to have had this opportunity and I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Owens, you've been patient, and if you would like two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, even five minutes, uh, you've got it. First down, 10 yards to go. You recognize Mr. Thank, Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I love the football analogy. It's something I still relate to years, years later. Uh, let, let me just, uh, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Elder and, and uh, Mr. Walker for their time. And just just give a, a minute or two, just to, just to quickly, if you have any conclusions that you might want to give, uh, uh, so I can wrap this up on my side. Uh, Mr. Walker, first, anything that you just want to quickly add uh, before we before we close this out? Mr. Walker, still there? Okay. What about Mr. Elder? Is he, is he still there? I am, and thank you so much. I do have a yeah, few. I'm here now. I'm here now. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Ursula. Go ahead, Herschel. I, I didn't hear your question. I'm in Texas and I'm in and out sometimes. It, it, just, just if you have any I, any any uh, question, uh, like, a, like a minute, a minute of conclusion, anything you just want to wrap up with before we, we close this out, uh, Herschel. Well, I, I I think I'd like to know. Uh, yes, I one of the major thing I asked here is uh, our forty, as I said earlier. Uh, I think it's very very important, but we go back to our constitution where I asked the question, why have we not held our constitution to what it promised to all men? And I think that is a major question because that's a who, why, and who is responsible. And I think once we can figure out who is responsible for not holding the constitution to what it promised to, the, to all men, we solve the problems and we heal the nation by healing all races, not just healing one. Because we demonize one group. And I think that is going to be, uh, that is a problem because I do believe in forgiveness and going forward together, as Dr. Martin Luther King mentioned about brotherhood, kinship. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ms. Walker. Um, Ms. Elder? Just a few quick things. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times that uh, reparations are owed to blacks for 400 years of slavery. Well, America was founded in 1787 and slavery ended uh, in 1865. So uh, that's substantially less than 400 years. It's also been mentioned that America has yet to atone for slavery. Well, remember that Lyndon Johnson launched the so-called war on poverty in 1965. He specifically talked about the need to redress past grievances for blacks. Since then, we've spent over $22 trillion uh, in, uh, in uh, payments uh, to fight the so-called war on poverty. Also, Mr. Cohen mentioned the wonderful story about Minnie Minoso. I remember Minnie Minoso, he's a great ball player. Uh, I'd like to give you a story too and conclude with this. Uh, I was in law school in 1974, 1975, I'm visiting my aunt who lives in Southfield, Michigan, right outside Detroit. And she and I are talking, the doorbell rings, the gentleman comes, who's about 40 years old, a friend of my aunt's, and he came in, he sat down as my aunt and I were talking. I was talking to my aunt about the classes I was taking, what I intended to do after I got out of law school. I looked up, and this 40-year-old black man was crying. 
I thought maybe I said something to offend him. I looked up and I said, excuse me, did I say something that bothered you? He says, no, no, no. I just wanted to be a lawyer too. And I had the potential to do it. I didn't take responsibility. I got caught up in too much jackassery and I blew my opportunity. I went to school with a lot of young uh, Japanese uh, kids, uh, Korean kids and Chinese kids. They all had something in common. They busted their butts in homework. You look at a graph of who does homework in America, uh, blacks, are, are, are outdone by, by Hispanics, who are outdone by whites, who are outdone by Asians. There is a reason that Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, and Korean Americans make more money per capita than do white Americans. They work hard, they don't complain, they take responsibility, and I would urge all of Americans to follow that example. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Elder. I just wanna wrap up just with this, this uh, just a little, uh, little bit of history real quick, guys. Uh, I was really blessed again to, to grow up in a household where my dad uh, had returned from war. <clears throat> I'm not sure uh, what 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 the other experiences were on this on the call here, but uh, the experiences of my dad and his and his brothers was that they came back from war and they were able to take take advantage of GI Bill. They actually um, uh, he came back he could not go to could not get his postgraduate degree in Texas where he grew up because of Jim Crow laws. I ran across a box of letters when he passed away eight years ago of rejection letters across this country. But what that generation did, they looked at that kind of rejection as motivation. He continued until he got to Ohio State where he got his PhD in agronomy. His brother got his PhD in, econ in economics. Uh, he went on and, and, and two, two, three years later is in Africa doing research. Now, I wanna ask you, how many, how many white Americans in the middle 1950s were living in Liberia, Africa? And I was a five-year-old kid, kid at the time uh, do, uh, with their parents doing research, traveling around the country. That's because that nation, that, that generation took advantage of every opportunity they had and they never felt sorry for themselves. They were out to, to, to win by commanding respect from those who needed to see them win. Uh, so dad came back, he was a, a 40 years of professor at Florida a m a very successful entrepreneur, researcher, a great mentor. And the most important thing, he taught us that you work hard, you work harder than the next guy, you start harder than the next guy, and you win in that process. That's the message we have to give. And, and I would ask that uh, uh, our Congresswoman, uh, 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 Congresswoman Jackson Lee, instead of showing something from 200 years ago, how about showing a picture of my dad? Uh, that generation of great men and women who really went through the toughest of time, grew up in the depression, went through the, this true segregation, the KKK, and they did not let it stop them. They led our nation, as I mentioned before, in, in, in all the categories of success because they understood that they, did, they that their, their, their kids deserved to see success full, full fledged. We need to take the time, instead of opening up past wounds, what's happening today to our kids? What are the policies that's happening in California that makes us a, such a high misery index in everything you can think of from education to uh to families to crime california is a place that should be showing all of us of, of, of in terms of a liberal democratic state of how this the, the policies work the policy is not working and at the end of the day there's no policies that we have to look at not the past because together we put the right policies where everybody has the same opportunities to for life living the pursuit of happiness and we can show everyone how great our country has always been in terms of opportunities and where we'll be, we're going in the future so please use my dad's picture and I'll send it to anyone who needs it in terms of what we're doing today instead of what happened 200 years ago from strangers we don't know. Uh, he's an example and, and Larry's, Larry's dad could say the same. I, could, I can go across the board. Anybody who grew up during the 50s and 60s understands what the greatest generation looked like and they were not people who were felt, felt sorry for themselves and they would be, they would be upset to, to hear that they've been looked at as victims today because they were victors in a big way and they're great examples of what, what the American dream really is all about. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Owens. I appreciate your, uh, your 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 testimony. I appreciate all the members of the committee and the, particularly the witnesses. They have given their perspectives. We've had a complete discussion of this issue and people support and against and for the reasons. And it's good that we have such hearings. Thank everybody for appearing. It's an important hearing. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Uh, with that, I declare this hearing. Uh, concluded and adjourned. Bang. Done. The whistle.